Hello guys, so this would be a quick review on anatomy. So we shall finish up the entire anatomy and uh, most important thing is that we shall cover the most high yield important things, right? So what are the high yield points that are asked all the time? So this thing we shall cover up and this I'm guaranteeing you that this will cover up most of your MCQs in the real exam, okay? And if you want detailed videos, detailed videos are separately recorded so you can watch those detailed videos. But for now, this is a quick review of all the topics together, right? So let us start on with the joints, okay? So in the joints, you know that there are two different types of classifications. One is called as a functional classification, other one is called as a structural classification. When it comes to the functional classification, there are three different types again, okay? So what are those three different types? One are called as freely movable joints, right? For example, if I'm moving my shoulder, right, to and fro, my shoulder is very freely movable. So such kind of joint is called as a freely movable joint, okay? Second important thing is that when I'm bending back, right? Now, can I touch my head to the buttocks? I cannot touch, right? Why? Because the motion is only limited. So that is why it is called slightly movable. And next important thing is that in the, in the head, you have got uh, different kinds of bones, right? Like parietal, frontal, occipital and all. Between them, you have got sutures. Right. So are these bones movable? They are not at all movable at all. Right. So these are called as immovable joints. So together we have got three important types of joints over here. One is called as a freely movable joints and the one is called as a slightly movable joints and the third one is called as a immovable joints. Okay. So freely movable joints and this description of joints which I've given just now comes under the functional classification. Okay. Now, freely movable joints are also given an other name that is called as diarthrosis. Freely movable joints are called as diarthrosis. Okay. Slightly movable is half. Half movable, right? Slightly is half. So, amphi. Amphi is also half. Amphi arthrosis. Amphi arthrosis. And immovable joints are completely these are not movable called as sin arthrosis. What is meant by sin? Sin means fusion. So when the joints fuse, they don't move. So that is why called as sin arthrosis. So we shall discuss these things in detail. But let me give one example to each one of them. For example, uh, if you come across diarthrosis, the example which I have given is your shoulder joint, right? So the example is your shoulder joint. So apart from shoulder joint, is there any other thing? Even the knee joint also is freely movable, right? Knee joint is also freely movable joint. Second important thing, slightly movable joints, what did I tell you? The joint that is located between two vertebra. Okay, what do you call it as? Intervertebral disc or IV disc. You can call it as IV disc or intervertebral disc. And immovable joints, what example I have given you? The sutures, right? These are called as your skull sutures. Skull sutures, right? So, cleanly we have finished the functional classification. Now what we shall do is that we shall go on to the second important classification that is structural. So functional is complete. So now we shall go for the structural classification. Coming to the structural classification based upon the structure of the joint, we divide the structural classification into three types, right? Now guys, you might be thinking I'm going a little bit faster, but regarding these joints, I've already recorded a two hour session where I've detailed much clearly, I mean, we have uh, uh, discussed with much detailed information there. So you can watch that video. As I already told you, this is a quick review. We have to finish up all the entire anatomy, the high yield part in uh, less time. So that is why we'll increase the pace, okay? So structural classification in the sense, what did I tell you? Based upon the structure of the joints, you divide the joints into three types. For example, if between the joint, if the joint is made up of fibers, it is called fibrous joint. If the joint is made up of cartilage, you call it as cartilaginous joint. If the joint is having synovial fluid in between, you call this as synovial joint. So that is what is structural classification, right? So these are the three important things. Now, one important uh, small part which you need to know here is that F stands for F stands for fibrous joints. F also stands for fixed joints. So when I tell fixed, if a joint is fixed, will it move? It will not move. So joints which are not moving are called what? Joints which are not moving are called as synarthrosis, right? So fixed joints are called as synarthrosis. Fixed joints are called as synarthrosis, okay? Within this synarthrosis, 
we come across three important types. Okay, what are those three important types? One is called as sutures. One is called as sutures. One is called as syndesmosis. Another one is called as gomphoses. Sutures, syndesmosis, and gomphoses. These are the three different types. So now what we shall do is that we shall first discuss about sutures, then syndesmosis, gomphoses. After that, we'll go on for the cartilages, and finally we'll go on for the synovial joints. Okay. So that structural classification is also done. Now we shall discuss the first part that is fibrous joint. Within this fibrous joints also we shall discuss the first part that is your sutures. Okay. So here the side heading fibrous joints sutures. Now just for an example I have drawn this picture telling you what are the sutures. You see FPO frontal bone, parietal bone, occipital bone. The suture that is located Okay, the suture that is located between frontal and parietal bone, suture that is located between the frontal and parietal bone is called frontoparietal suture. Right, so this suture is called as frontoparietal suture. Frontoparietal suture is also called as coronal suture. Frontoparietal suture or coronal suture. The suture that is present between parietal and occipital is called parieto occipital suture or also called as lamboid suture. Parieto, parieto occipital suture or you can call it as lamboid suture. Okay, so this is the uh, suture. Right, what are the different types of sutures? We shall discuss that. I am just giving you, I am just briefing up what are sutures, what are syndosmos, and what are ground forces. Okay, so sutures are done. This is just a brief information which you need to know regarding the sutures. Okay, now next, when it comes to the second important thing, after the sutures, we have got syndesmosis. Okay, now what are these syndesmoses? Now, all of you look here. This is your tibia and this is your fibula. Now, between the tibia and fibula, in the lower part, you have got a joint. This joint is called as tibiofibular joint. Okay, joint between tibia and fibula is called tibiofibular joint. And where it is located? It is located in the lower part. So, collectively, you have to call it as inferior, inferior tibiofibular joint. Inferior tibiofibular joint. So, this joint over here, green color one, which I have highlighted over here is your inferior tibiofibular joint. So, that is one example of syndesmosis. Okay. So, let me write the heading over here. The second part which I shall be discussing is your syndesmosis. Syndesmosis. The first joint in syndesmosis is inferior tibiofibular joint. Second important See, one bone over here is called as your radius, one bone over here is called as your ulna. One is radius, one is ulna. Now, between the radius and ulna, the joints which are present over here are called as radio ulna joints. How many radio ulna joints are there? Three radio ulna joints. What are these three radio ulna joints? See, this one on the top, this is in the middle, and this is in the bottom. So, the joint which is located on the top is called as superior. Superior radio ulna joint. The second important one is called as middle radio ulna joint. Middle radio ulna joint. So one is superior radio ulna joint, one is middle radio ulna joint, and another one is your inferior radio ulna joint. Inferior radio ulna joint. Okay, inferior radio ulna joint. Now, out of these three joints, we shall see which is movable, which is immovable, right? So, the superior radio ulna joint is movable joint, okay? Inferior radio ulna joint is also movable joint, but the middle radio ulna joint is an immovable joint. Immovable joint, right? So, when I am doing this kind of action, this is called pronation. This is called supination. So, pronation is done by superior radio ulna and inferior radio ulna. The middle radio ulna is not responsible for this. Okay, so keep this thing in mind. So two. So uh, what are the two important things which we have to discuss over here? That the first example is the inferior uh, tibiofibular joint, and the second example is this one. 
so this comes as a second example what is this middle radio ulnar joint is discussed as a second example okay second example of what second example of syndesmosis okay so what did i tell you syndesmosis is coming in fibrous fibrous is fixed which are not moving so here what is the joint that is not moving middle radio ulnar joint so this is a thing which you need to keep in your mind okay so after suture syndesmosis we have to discuss about gomphosis what is gomphosis gomphosis is nothing but dento alveolar joint you see the tooth is getting fixed within the alveolar socket right so that is the reason why this gomphosis is called as dento alveolar joint dento alveolar joint okay next we have to discuss about the cartilaginous joints but regarding this we'll discuss later first we shall finish up with the synovial joints because many important things are over here so most of the joints in your body are synovial joints so this is a typical synovial joint which you can see over here right now in this typical synovial joint let us see what are these structures now the first important thing which you need to know over here is that here the, there is a pink color line there is a green color line okay what is this pink color line called as this is called as tunica intima tunica intima okay Next, the green color line is called as tunica subintima. Tunica subintima. One is tunica intima, another one is tunica subintima. One is tunica intima, tunica subintima, right? Now, both of them together you call it as synovial layer. Synovial layer. Okay? Both of them together you call it as synovial layer. Next important thing is that this structure which is marked over here is called as your synovial fluid. Synovial fluid. Okay. Next on the surface of the bones attached to the surface of the bone there is a blue color lining which you can see. This is a place where one bone articulates with another bone. You call this as articular cartilage. Articular cartilage. Okay. So one is called as articular cartilage, one is called as synovial fluid, tunica intima, tunica subintima, together you call it as synovial layer and the outermost layer is called as a fibrous layer. What is the outermost layer? Fibrous layer. So if I ask you what will you tell? Outer fibrous layer, right? Inner synovial layer, right? So together what do you call it as? You call this as a synovial capsule, right? You call this a synovial capsule. So one very important thing you need to know is that synovial fluid, right, synovial fluid is completely sterile fluid. Now if there is any kind of infection that enters into the synovial fluid, what will happen? This condition you call it as synovitis, okay, synovitis. You can see the infection of the uh, knee over here, right. So this is a condition of synovitis over here, okay, right. Now second important thing which you need to understand over here, what is this? For example, if you are looking at the knee from the side. If you are looking at the knee from the side, this is how it looks. Okay. You see one is your femur, your tibia, in front your petella. Above the petella, there is a bursa. What is a bursa? Bursa is a cushion-like thing. Okay. So above the petella, there is a bursa that you call it as suprapetellar bursa. Suprapetellar bursa. Next, in front of the petella, there is a bursa that is called as pre- Petalar bursa, supra petalar bursa, pre petalar bursa. There is a bursa below the petala, you call it as infra petalar bursa. So, about these bursa, I have talked very much detail previously. Now, I'll directly go into the point that if there is inflammation, there is any kind of inflammation of pre petalar bursa, you call this condition as housemaid's knee. What is this condition? You call it as you call this condition as housemate's knee. Housemate's knee. If there is any infection of the infrapetalar bursa, you call this condition as clergyman's knee. Clergyman's knee. So there are two important things. One is called as the housemate's knee. Another one is called as the clergyman's knee. Okay. Now let us look at the cases over here. Now if these are the cases, if they are given in your exam, so how will you answer these cases? So if you look at the right and the left knee over here, so this is your right knee, this is your left knee, right? So in front of the left knee, you see a swelling over here. This swelling is located in front of the petella. So you call this as pre-petellar bursitis. 
or you can also call it as a housemaid's need. So even in this condition also there is a housemaid's need. Coming to the third and fourth condition, now don't think that this is petella, no. Where is your petella? Your petella is over here, this is petella. Now if there is a bursa that is uh, inflamed below the petella, what bursa it might be? This might be infrapetellar bursitis, okay. So here also you see a swelling, this is called as your infrapetellar bursitis. Now if you look at the MRI scan over here, so let us name the structures over here. This is your femur, this is your tibia and number three is your petella, this is your petella, okay, that is your petella. Now what is this uh, part over here? This is a fat pad called as a hoffa pad, hoffa pad, this thing you will study in radiology anyways. And the next important thing is you see this black color lines over here, one is ACL, another one is PCL, that also you will study in um, radiology anyways okay so here what you need to know is uh, petella femur and tibia you know there is if there is a bursa there is a bursa above the petella suprapetellar bursitis inflammation of bursa before the petella prepetellar bursitis below the petella that is infrapetellar bursitis let us look at the first case now remember one thing any bright lesion which you see over here that is the pathology that is the inflammation okay so here first we come across the femur this is the tibia, this is the petella. Now you see a lesion that is located in front of the petella, right, an inflammation. So you can see that there is a area, there is a hyper intense uh, lesion that is located in front of the petal over here. So this thing on an MRI is prepetellar bursitis. If you go to the next case, here also you see a lesion that is located in front of the petella. This is called prepetellar bursitis. Okay, right. So the next important thing which you need to know is that as I already told you, let us go back to the classification over here. What is the classification which we have discussed over here? We have discussed about sutures, syndesmosis, gomphosis. We have also discussed about synovial joints, right? What did I tell you? I told you regarding sutures, I've just told you two important sutures. One is frontoparietal suture or coronal suture. Another one is parato-occipital or lamboid suture. Now what we shall do, we shall discuss what are the different types of sutures which we basically have over here, okay. So if you look at the different types of sutures, the first important type of suture which you can see over here, this is bone number one, bone number two. Look at the end surfaces of these two bones, they are completely even, right, they are completely even. So that is why you call such kind of suture as plain suture, plain suture. Where is this plain suture located? You can see here, see this is bone number 1, this is bone number 2, you can see the margins over here. So this particular suture is called as plain suture, okay, which is located between the two palatine bones of the maxilla. Second important, right, what is the second important thing? This kind of uh, suture which you can see, the ends are plain, but it looks as if one bone is overlapping on other bone. So such kind of suture you call it as a squamous suture, squamous suture. Okay, squamous suture. In this picture here you can see that this is your temporal bone, this is your parietal bone. You can see a groove that is present here, this is actually not a groove, this is that the temporal bone is overlapping on the parietal bone over here. Okay, so this is your temporal, this is your parietal. Clear? So the suture that is located between the temporal and the parietal bone is called as temporoparietal suture. Okay, next important thing is the third one that we have got two bones over here. So look at the ends of each of the bone, they are serrated. So such kind of suture where there are serrated margins are called as serrated suture, okay? Or you can also call it as saw edge suture. You can also call it as saw edge suture, okay? You call it as a serrated or the saw edge suture. Now all of you look here, uh, between the two frontal bones over here, you see this suture. This is a serrated suture or a saw edge suture, you see, right. Second important suture is that, the last important suture is that, you see one end is having tooth like processes, right. So these tooth like processes of one bone are fitting into the tooth like processes of the other bone. So this kind of suture is called as dentate suture, dentate suture, right. Where is your dentate suture, see. Parietal, parietal, occipital, okay, parietal, parietal, occipital, you see the, the depressions over here, so this is nothing but your dentate suture like this, 
clear so how many four different types of switches we have discussed one is plain squamous serrated or soiled another one is called as dented now let us come to the cartilage joints you remember that we did not discuss about cartilage joints in the classification right so coming to the cartilage joints there are two different types of cartilage joints one is called as a primary another one is called as a secondary any cartilage joint that is appearing from birth itself not after birth i am telling you appearing from birth which appears from birth that joint you called as a primary cartilage joint any joint which appear after birth appear after birth is called as a secondary cartilage joint okay if you look at the picture here all of you know you have studied uh, in your plus 1 and plus 2 also that the ends of the bone are called epiphyses okay so you can see over here that uh, this yellow color part which i have highlighted on either side this is called as epiphyses this is called as what this is called as your epiphysis okay now after this a uh, down here also you called as epiphysis yes or no next important thing is the center part which you can see over here is called as diaphysis so one is epiphysis and the other one is called as diaphysis between the epiphysis and diaphysis that white part where the growth plate is present that is called as metaphysis right so what is metaphysis having what did i tell you it is having a structure called as growth plate it is having a structure called as growth plate okay now what is this growth plate made up of this growth plate is made up of hyaline cartilage growth plate is made up of hyaline cartilage as i have already already told you that we are discussing cartilage in joint so we have to discuss about a cartilage that is present okay next important thing is secondary secondary appears after the birth now easy way to remember the secondary cartilage joints are any joint that is located in the midline of your body are called as secondary cartilage joints so running from here do you have any joints no now here you have got the sternum within the sternum you have got two joints and down here in the abdomen abdomen no joints and all the way down if you go you have got the pubic bones right so in the sternum and down here down here you see what is the joint that is located in the center exactly if i am drawing a mid line in the center what is the joint this is the joint now these two are not the joints which are located in the center so these two are not secondary anything which is located in the mid line of your body any joint located in the mid line of your body is called as a what that is called as your secondary cartilage joints so the first example goes here that this is present between the manubrium and the body you call it as a manubrio sternal joint manubrio sternal joint okay next important thing next important uh, joint over here after manubrio sternal joint is called as your zifo sternal joint the second important joint over here is called as the zifo sternal joint okay now after that the third important joint over here which you can see in the center is called as the joint between the pubic symphysis pubic symphysis okay so that is your third important type of joint over here clear so next important thing which you need to know that what are the different types of synovial joints i have discussed about synovial joints right now we shall discuss what are the different types of synovial joints over here now easy way to remember is that police had pulled a car sadly because he found a suspicious bag right so what are these p stands for what planar joints h stands for hinge joint p stands for pivot joint C stands for uh, condylar joint, S stands for saddle and ball and socket. You need to remember in the exact same way because the first three are the first three are the uniaxial joints. Because the first three are uniaxial joints, uniaxial joints. Okay. The next two are called as biaxial joints, biaxial joints. So uniaxial joints. Next you, two you have got biaxial joints. third important one is called as your multiaxial joint multiaxial joints right so we shall discuss one by one now the first important joint is your planar joint okay now coming to this planar joint what is this planar joint you see the bones over here these bones are your carpal bones now in between the carpal bones if there is a joint you call it as what anything in between you call it as inter 
right so the first important thing is these are called as intercarpal joints right the same way between the tarsals also we have got joints these are called as intertarsal joints only two examples no there are remaining examples also i will give you a list later on okay intercarpal intertarsal or your planar joints next important thing coming to the hinge joint so this is called as a hinge what is the use of the hinge it will hold the door so with the help of this hinge either you can close the door or you can open the door so opening and closing are happening in a single line yes or no so you close this way you open this way right now can you lift the door up or down you can rotate it no you can't do these actions either you can go in this direction or you can come back in the same direction so only one axis is there so that is why you called as uniaxial joint for example look at the elbow i can either flex my elbow or i can extend my elbow look at this either i can flex or extend can i can i rotate my elbow no so in uniaxial knee also the same right next next important thing is that between the phalanges whatever joint you have interphalangeal joint see either flexion or extension can i can i bend it like this no so the first example over here is your elbow joint okay the second example over here is your knee joint knee joint and the third example over here is your interphalangeal joint interphalangeal joint so three important joints over here third important example is a pivot joint now when it comes to the pivot joint i think when i was discussing the joints i very clearly explained you the pivot joint let us just write directly right on the examples here right so there is also a video on youtube where you will have the detailed explanation of each and every joint there so there is a separate section called as joints where you will have that video okay the first important example is between the at atlas and axis that is atlanto axial joint atlanto axial joint between the atlas and axis second important thing is superior radio ulnar joint radio ulnar joint and the we have got is a inferior radio ulnar joint radio ulnar joint superior and inferior radio ulnar joint okay now the third important thing over here is your condylar joint condylar joint is also called as bicondylar why because there are two ends here of the bone that there are two ends each end is called as a condyle so two ends bicondyle but one one end is convex and the other end is concave so can i tell like this that the convexity of one bone is fitting into the concavity of other bone so such kind of uh, joint you call it as condylar joint if you even if you look at the picture here right so you can see that this is convex and the second bone that is a tibia is concave so the knee joint is a very good example of the condylar joint okay not only the knee joint not only the knee joint look at the second example over here this is called as temporomandibular joint temporo mandibular joint so remember the concept what is the concept concept is convex fitting into concave just look here there are two convex surfaces fitting into the concave surface so it is a temporomandibular joint next compare these two joints over here in the first joint one is convex one is concave right this discussion we have done now look at the second important in the second important thing again here one is convex but the second one is not concave it is ellipsoid what is the variety of the joint over here it is ellipsoid so the joint that is formed between one and two over here is called as ellipsoidal joint so one very important example of ellipsoidal joint is your wrist joint is your wrist joint okay just look over here you see is it see first of all what are all these all these are your carpels carpels so the uh, surface of the carpels is concave or convex it is convex second important thing over here is you can see a ellipsoidal uh, nature of the joint over here so this is called as a wrist joint the next important thing is a saddle joint now uh, this is a saddle joint what what is a saddle joint saddle joint is having both what convexity it is having concavity 
so it is all on the other bone also it is having a concavity like this and convexity so concavity and convexity of one bone is fitting into concavity and convexity of the other bone so how do you remember this remember the examples in this way that is masti first year and study later so what is masti m stands for malleus you have got incus you have got steps three bones malleus incus and steps so the joint that is located between the malleus and incus is called as what that is called as your saddle joint second important thing over here is your first carpo metacarpal joint first carpo metacarpal joint first carpo metacarpal joint third important thing is your sternoclavicular joint sternoclavicular joint this is a third important example fourth important example is your lateral longitudinal arch lateral longitudinal arch right so what is the joint over here what is this particular joint over here this is called as your sternoclavicular joint joint number 3 and what is this arch over here this arch is called as a lateral longitudinal arch okay the next important thing is a ball and socket joint very easy to remember that remember by the mnemonic sita s i t a now what does s stand for here s stands for s stands for what shoulder joint s stands for shoulder joint or you can also call it as a hip joint so even hip joint and the shoulder joint both of them are ball and socket second important thing i what does i stands for see you have got malleus you have got incus you have got steps between malleus and incus we have already covered it is what it is your saddle joint now the joint between incus and steps this is called as insudo stepedial joint insudo stepedial joint that is insudo stepedial joint is your ball and socket joint third important uh, joint over here is called as this is the joint that is located between three bones see this bone is called as the talus bone this bone is called as the navicular bone and the next bone over here is called as your calcaneus calcaneus bone so the joint located between all these three what is that you call it as talo calcaneo navicular bone talo calcaneo navicular bone okay next important thing is the plain synovial joints how many plain synovial joints are there there are four important types how do you remember remember by the airlines vistara okay so what does v stands for vertebral joint what vertebral it is costo vertebral joint costo vertebral joint next i stands for intercarpal joints inter carpal joints right next what does if i tell intercarpal there will be intertarsal also intertarsal you remember that we have discussed intercarpal and intertarsal in the starting i told you plain synovial joints okay let me show it to you here so i have already told you that planar joints right so the planar joints i have given only two examples now i am giving you the remaining examples of planar joint right so these are the remaining examples which i'm giving to you here so intercarpal and intertarsal were the things which we discussed before what does s stand for s stands for superior tibio fibular superior tibio fibular joint so where is superior tibio fibular so this one is superior tibio fibular and in syndesmos as you remember we have discussed inferior tibio fibular next important thing the fourth important thing over here is cricothyroid joint cricothyroid joint so what does t stand for thyroid what thyroid cricothyroid next we have got ara ara right so all of you know the tc in the sense it is thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage so between the cricoid and thyroid what is the joint over here this is called as cricothyroid what is this this is called as your cricothyroid joint crico thyroid joint next we have got arytenoids and we have got cricoid right so this joint over here is called as crico arytenoid joint so two types of joints one is called as crico thyroid another one is called as crico arytenoid joint okay so this completes the plain synovial joints let us just sum up all these joints over here see tell me what is this kind of joint that is located between the sternum as well as your clavicle 
you call it as a sternoclavicular joint sternoclavicular joint so what is a sternoclavicular joint sternoclavicular joint is a type of saddle joint the second important type of joint over here is called as acromio acromioclavicular joint okay acromioclavicular joint that is located between the acromion process and the clavicle so this acromioclavicular joint is also called as a plain synovial joint third important thing between the uh, i mean the shoulder joint we also call it as a ball and socket joint so instead of writing it as shoulder joint i'm just writing it as ball and socket joint this is your ball and socket joint next important thing the elbow joint right so this is your elbow joint elbow joint is an example of what it is a hinge joint elbow joint is an example of hinge joint elbow joint is an example of hinge joint next we have got another joint over here this is called a superior radio ulnar joint middle radio ulnar joint inferior radio ulnar joint okay so superior radio ulnar joint is also called as what it is called as your pivot joint middle radio ulnar joint is called as what syndesmosis syndesmosis and inferior radio ulnar joint is again called as pivot joint we have discussed these things right next this is called as your wrist joint what is this this is called as your wrist joint and this wrist joint is what ellipsoidal joint ellipsoidal joint again this one also we have discussed this right next important thing is that the joint that is located between carpals and metacarpals is called as carpometacarpal joint carpometacarpal joint okay so out of all carpometacarpal joint the first carpometacarpal joint is called as a saddle joint so the first one is called as your saddle joint the first one is called as your saddle joint okay next important thing over here is that you have got a joint called as metacarpophalangeal between the metacarpals and the phalanges so this one over here is called as your ellipsoidal joint ellipsoidal and finally between the phalanges the joints which you have got is called as the interphalangeal joints interphalangeal joints and these interphalangeal joints are an example of a hinge joint hinge joint okay so from this particular picture whatever i have explained you many mcqs were repeated in the previous years very 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 high yield this is very 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 high yield point which you need to know now coming to some mcqs which are repeated previously are what is the most common dislocated joint in the body that is your glenohumeral joint that is your shoulder joint between the glenoid and the humerus which kind of dislocation is more common anterior dislocation is more common than the posterior dislocation right next important thing that they have asked is when you are abducting your arm to 90 degrees like this right so what are the two important angles that are formed when you are abducting your arm there are two important measurements you need to take gh is 60 degrees gh means glenohumeral elevation how much is that 60 degrees next important thing is scapulothoracic see here scapulothoracic simple thing you do draw a transverse line like this right draw a horizontal line draw a vertical line from the vertical line all the way make a perpendicular like this from the vertical line to the perpendicular that is called as your scapular thoracic elevation so that is around 30 degrees so 60 and 30 what is the uh, ratio here 2 is to 1 scapulo humeral rhythm is called as 2 is to 1 over here this is a important thing which you need to know right next question they have been asked is that below the clavicle if you are putting your finger there is a fossa so in this fossa what is the part of the bone part which part of the scapula is palpable that is a coracoid process of the scapula that is palpable below the clavicle right below the clavicle in the sense infra clavicular fossa and uh, these are the things which you need know already right see this is called as a head this is called as a base but for the first metacarpal it is reverse so this is the head and this is the base right on the head region itself you have got what epiphysis but when it comes to the first metacarpal the epiphysis is located at the base it is in reverse right so coming to the wrist wrist joint is formed by look at this picture clearly wrist joint is formed by you see this bone over here is your radius bone next is you have got uh, this particular bone called as scaphoid bone you have got this particular lunate and this is called as trichoderm 
Look at the ulnar bone. Where is it? See, this is your ulnar bone. Is the ulnar bone touching the joint surface? No. So, ulnar bone is not taking part in the formation of a wrist joint. So, this particular joint which you can see over here like this is your wrist joint. Formed by what? Radius, scaphoid, triquetrum, lunate. Not by ulna. Okay. So, these are the questions which I want uh, you to uh, do it guys. So, these are the questions which are repeated previously and very very high. Okay. So, now we shall be uh, clubbing up all the important things that will be most frequently asked in the upper limb part. Okay. So, we shall not miss a single question that will be asked from the upper limb. So, coming on to the upper limb over here, you know, this picture, within this picture, you have got the mesoderm, right? So, this part over here is your mesoderm. So, mesoderm is divided into three important uh, parts over here, right? So, this part which you can see, this is called as the paraaxial mesoderm, right? So, till here you call this as a paraaxial mesoderm. On the complete extreme, you call this as a lateral plate mesoderm. Between the lateral plate mesoderm and paraaxial mesoderm, whatever mesoderm this one you have is called as an intermediate mesoderm. Okay. So, how many different types of mesoderm you have got? Three different types of mesoderm you have got. Okay. And outer layer is called ectoderm, inner layer is called endoderm, but whatever it is. So, here if you see, there are three different types of mesoderm. Once again, one is called as a paraaxial mesoderm. On the sides of paraaxial mesoderm, you have got uh, the intermediate mesoderm. On sides of the intermediate mesoderm, you have got the lateral plate mesoderm. Okay. So, let us see. Paraaxial mesoderm is developing into what? Paraaxial mesoderm usually develops into your skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles. Lateral plate mesoderm develops into what? It develops into your upper limb and lower limb. Upper limb and lower limb and intermediate mesoderm develops into what it develops into your genito urinary system genito urinary system so previously the questions have been asked from this okay so genito urinary system now when does the development of upper limb start guys the upper limb development starts at the end of the fourth week starts at the end of what end of the fourth okay so, lower limb development starts at the beginning of the fifth week. Beginning of the fifth week. So, remember these two terms here. One is end, one is beginning. Okay. End of the fourth week, beginning of the fifth. Now, when is the, now this is regarding the upper limb and lower limb, but uh, this particular question which I have kept over here was also asked from the development. Okay. But this has nothing to do with the upper limb. I have just kept it as a side point that when is the first heartbeat heard? The first heartbeat is heard during the fourth week, right? So, on a transvaginal ultrasound, you see the first heartbeat. So, fourth week. Fourth week on transvaginal ultrasound. Okay. Now, let us just look at the questions which were asked over here uh, previously. Now, lateral plate mesoderm and paraaxial mesoderm, they are developed into what, right? So, lateral plate mesoderm, as I already told you, lateral plate mesoderm is developed into upper limb and lower limb, right? So, upper limb and lower limb. Whereas, uh, paraaxial mesoderm is developed into, paraaxial is developed into skeletal muscles. So, skeletal muscles, option D will be your answer. In the same way, I am leaving a second question for you. I want you to answer and comment down in the comment box, okay? Right. Let us start uh, discussing the upper limb here with the bones, okay. The first bone which we always come across is your clavicle. So, what are the important points that are so far asked from the clavicle? First important point which you need to know over here, that clavicle is the only bone that is horizontally placed. Clavicle is the only bone that is horizontally. And out of all the bones in your body, the first bone to ossify is your clavicle, okay. So, when does this ossification start? During 5th to 6th week of intrauterine life and the question has been asked previously on this. The most common fractured bone in the body is clavicle. The question was not asked any time but still it is better to remember this. What is the use of the clavicle? Right? So, all of you know this is your axial skeleton. Okay? All this part is your appendicular skeleton. Axial skeleton in the sense skull, vertebral column and all of this. Appendicular skeleton in the sense your upper limb and lower limbs. Okay? So, the entire weight of the upper limb is finally impended upon what? Clavicle. And from the clavicle, the weight is transmitted to the axial skeleton. Okay. So, 
it transmits weight of the upper limb to the axial skeleton very important point and fifth important thing is that from the start till the end when you palpate this bone this bone is completely subcutaneous which means it can be palpable just beneath the skin so subcutaneous throughout and it has got no medullary cavity this is one of the very very important uh, point to understand this is also a very important point okay so questions were asked previously so what is the most common site of clavicular fracture there was also another question which was asked here that is that is what is the most common site yes tell me what can be the most common site most of the students start telling that it is a medial to the lateral one third but there is a new update that it is medial Three fifth, medial three fifth, and lateral two fifth. The junction between medial three fifth and lateral two. Fifth, okay, the junction between medial three fifth and lateral two fifth is the site for clavicular fracture. If you look at this X-ray here also, so in this X-ray also it is very clear that this part all the way till here is the medial three fifth. Okay. And this small part which is located over here is the lateral two fifth. So medial three fifth and lateral two fifth is the part. Now another important clinical point which can be asked, which is not asked so far, but there is a high chance that they can ask you that there is a condition where the clavicles are absent. So the condition where the clavicles are underdeveloped or absent is called as aplastic clavicles. Okay, you can see the condition over here that the uh, father and uh, maybe she might be his daughter so they both don't have the clavicles right so this condition you call it as cledo cranial dysostosis this is called cledo cranial dysostosis or dysplasia this is called as cledo cranial dysostosis or dysplasia okay so this is one of the very important thing you need to understand over here now second important question which is all the time asked that if you can look at look at the joints over here if you can look at the joints over here see what is this a over here this a is connecting the first rib this a is see here this a is connecting the first rib to the clavicle right so what is this joint over here this joint over here is called as costoclavicular ligament okay costoclavicular ligament in the same way what is b over here b is connecting the coracoid process to the clavicle this is called as coracoclavicular ligament so what i'm telling you is that the entire weight of the upper limb is first transmitted on to the coracoclavicular ligament from coracoclavicular ligament the weight is then transmitted to the clavicle from the clavicle the weight is getting transmitted to what costoclavicular ligament and from there it is transmitted to your center part i mean the axial skeleton you understood it right so if i asked that the weight of the upper limb transmitted to clavicle by the weight of the upper limb this is the weight of the upper limb transmitted to the clavicle how it is transmitted to the clavicle with the help of b what is b that is coracoclavicular ligament so let us write it down that is your coraco clavicular ligament in the same way the weight of the upper limb transmitted to the axial skeleton this is your axial skeleton now the weight of the upper limb how it is transmitted to the axial skeleton with the help of a what is this a that is costoclavicular ligament what is this a that is your that is your costoclavicular costoclavicular ligament that is your costoclavicular ligament okay now if you see here there are two more additional structures what are those two more additional structures are if you can look here that this particular cavity which you can see right this particular cavity is called glenoid cavity and this is the head of the humerus so head of the humerus is fitting into the glenoid cavity and here there is a ligament like this what is this ligament this is called glenohumeral ligament okay glenohumeral ligament in the same way the coracoid process is also having a ligament that is attached to the humerus this is called as coracohumeral ligament how many ligaments are there two ligaments one is called as glenohumeral ligament another one is called as coracohumeral ligament so what is the use of this glenohumeral and coracohumeral they what are they they are the ligaments of the shoulder joint so what is happening overall here there is a joint that is formed this joint is called shoulder joint 
and if i ask you what ligaments are responsible for the formation of shoulder joint one is called as glenohumeral another one is called as coracohumeral okay not only glenohumeral and coracohumeral you should also mention one more important thing that is coracoclavicular even this one is also all these three together they form the shoulder joint all these three together i mean they don't form actually they they are present near the shoulder Okay, so they are called as the ligaments of the shoulder joint. So if I ask you what are the three important ligaments of the shoulder joint, what will you tell? One is called as coracoclavicular ligament. Okay, another one is called as glenohumeral ligament, and the third important one is called as coracohumeral ligament. Okay, these are the three important ligaments that you would come across. So, regarding that, there are a few questions which I have kept over here. I want you to answer these questions. Okay, so let us very fastly let us look into these questions over here. Eight year old boy presents with extreme shoulder motion. Eight year old boy is presenting with extreme shoulder motion, frontal blossom. Chest x ray is shown. What is the most likely diagnosis? Now, in this chest x ray, what is the thing you can see? You don't see any clavicle over here, absent clavicles. Absent clavicles is a feature of what? Cledocranial dysplasia. Okay. So I want you to do the remaining two questions also. Okay. So these two questions, I want you to do it. Okay. So let us move on to the second important thing. <coughs> Coming to the scapula. Now, regarding the clavicle, those are the important points which you need to know. Regarding the scapula, the topography is very, very important. So what is the topography over here is that? You see, this is a superior angle of the scapula. This is the medial border of the scapula. This is the inferior angle of scapula. All of you know another important thing that this is called as a spine of the scapula. So if I ask you where is the superior border, you have to tell the superior border is at the level of what? It is at the level of T2. Okay. Where is the spine of the scapula present? It is present at the level of T3. T3, we have got spine. Okay. And in the same way, uh, the inferior angle is present at the level of T7. Okay, these are the three important questions which were asked previously and the most important thing is that for this bone, every bone has got a head, humerus is having a head, metacarpals they have a head, every bone has got a head. Now, if I ask you that where is the head of the scapula located, which one will you choose? See, out of uh, medial border and out of the lateral border, which is the thickest border, just look at the picture and see. So, obviously, you see this is the thickest border. So, this is called as the head of the scapula. The lateral border of scapula is the thickest and it is called as a head of the scapula. Lateral border is called as the head of the scapula. Lateral border is called as the head of the scapula. Right? So, if I ask you overall, so scapula extends all the way from the second till seventh posterior ribs. Right? So, second till seventh posterior ribs. Okay? So, this is what the important thing which you need to know. Now, let us look at the clinical condition within the scapula. So, usually scapula should descend down. Scapulas are present in the cervical region. They should descend down. What will happen if the scapula does not descend down? See here, in one picture here, one on the right side, the scapula is in a normal position. But here you see scapula, it looks as if scapula got stuck in the neck, right? So, this condition you called as Sprengel deformity, which is also called as congenitally high scapula. One scapula is high. Failure of the scapula to descend down. Okay, so this is one important clinical condition. Let us, these are the important questions that are asked. One is the topography, another one is the head of the scapula, which one is the head of the scapula and the next one is Sprengel deformity, okay. These are the only questions that can be asked from the scapula here. Coming to the humerus, all of you know these anatomical parts very well, but the important anatomical part which I want you to remember here is what is lateral lip, what is medial lip, what is bicipital groove. These are the three important structures I want you to remember. Why? Because there are some muscles that are attached to lateral lip, medial lip and bicipital group. So, how do you remember those muscles? Remember by mnemonic, a lady between two majors. Okay, a lady between two majors. Who are the two majors? One is called pectoralis major, another one is called teres major. Where is pectoralis major? Where is teres major located? Better to understand that, look at the mnemonic MET. ME stands for medial lip. What is ME stands for? medial lip. T stands for what? Say T stands for teres or T stands for pectoralis? Teres. So, teres major is attached to medial lip. Medial lip in the sense, pe, see this is the medial lip. To, to here, 
the teres major is attached obviously the other one will be attached to the lateral lip lateral lip okay so in between both of them medial lip and lateral lip in between both of them you see this yellow color marked area that is called as intertubercular sulcus or bicipital groove okay into this bicipital groove a lady is present what is this lady is latissimus dorsi where is this present it is present in the bicipital groove bicipital groove or you can also call it as intertubercular sulcus intertubercular sulcus intertubercular sulcus very 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 important question multiple times this has been asked in the exam okay so i have kept the direct question which was asked previously which muscle is inserted to the floor of the intertubercular sulcus and the answer goes is latissimus dorsi a lady right next important thing we shall be discussing over here this is one important question that will be asked and the second important question that will be asked is anatomical neck and surgical neck okay so you see this is your anatomical neck and this is your surgical near the surgical neck an artery is present a vein is uh, a nerve is present what is the artery that is present over here anterior circumflex humeral artery and posterior circumflex humeral artery anterior and posterior circumflex i will discuss about that in a minute anterior and posterior circumflex humeral artery what is the nerve that is present axillary nerve but if you see here if an artery is coming from the front like this this is anterior circumflex if an artery is going from the back this is called posterior circumflex now in this picture only front you can see so i have written it as anterior circumflex but what i am telling you is that from anterior circumflex you see a branch that is running into the intertubercular sulcus over here right i hope all of you can uh, appreciate that there is a branch that is running within this intertubercular sulcus or the bicipital groove so this branch is going up right so that is why you call this as ascending branch of anterior circumflex humeral artery this was a question once that was asked in the exam okay ascending branch next important thing in this we can uh, discuss maximum number of mcqs okay look at the surgical neck within the surgical neck the first important point that is the uh, green color one over here what is that called as that is your axillary nerve axillary nerve surround so just near to this axillary nerve you have got an artery over here what is this artery anterior and post anterior and posterior circumflex humeral artery okay where are they both present they are both present to the surgical neck what if i get a fracture of surgical neck what if i have a fracture of surgical neck so surgical neck fracture will lead to which nerve injury and which artery rupture so these are the answers next important thing so you can see this uh, oblique line which i have drawn with a oblique dotted line which i have drawn dotted in the sense this is present on the back not on the front okay so which is present on the back that is called as your radial groove radial groove so within this radial groove what do you have within this radial groove you have got a radial nerve radial nerve so where is radial nerve present in the anterior or posterior it is present posteriorly so which fractures will lead to radial nerve injury yes tell me fractures of the shaft of the humerus you can also call it as a mid shaft humeral fractures mid shaft humeral fractures will lead to the damage here next important thing is that here if you see one is medial epicondyl another one is lateral epicondyl see this is lateral epicondyl this is medial epicondyl behind the medial epicondyl there is a nerve that is passing what is that this is called as ulnar nerve okay so which fractures will lead to ulnar nerve injury that is medial epicondyle fractures medial epicondyle fractures medial epicondyle fractures in the same way in the same way if you look exactly in the center so let me highlight this part you see this particular region this particular region is located between above medial and lateral epicondyle so this region is called as the supracondylar region so in the supracondylar region what are the two structures we have got one we have got is the median nerve another one we have got is the brachial artery brachial artery so if we have by chance any kind of supracondylar fractures supracondylar fracture what can happen this can lead to median nerve injury and brachial artery rupture 
So I want you to remember this box at any cost, very, 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 very high yield. Okay. Now, one very important thing you need to remember is that what will happen if axillary nerve is damaged? Axillary nerve, remember the mnemonic DAT, that. Okay. What is A here? Axillary nerve. Axillary nerve supplies two important muscles. D stands for deltoid. D stands for deltoid. That is one muscle which it supplies. Another one T stands for teres minor. Okay, so what is going to happen if deltoid and teres minor, if, if there is axillary nerve injury, what will happen? Your deltoid muscle is not innervated now. So what will happen? This deltoid muscle is not used. If it is not used, this will undergo atrophy. Okay, so this will undergo atrophy and that will give you a flat shoulder. Just look here. He is having a deltoid muscle here. But here, look here. There is no deltoid muscle. Why? Because there is a flat shoulder. There is atrophy. Okay, flat shoulder. Okay, so this is a flat shoulder. Next important thing is that exactly this circle, whatever uh, that has been drawn in the picture, this is the place where the sensations are perceived. Okay, so here if axillary nerve is damaged, exactly at this part there is no sensation, there is loss of sensation. Okay, so that gives you a regimental badge or patch. What is regimental badge or patch? So you put a badge or patch here, right? Exactly here. So exactly at that place, you won't have any sensations. Okay. So that condition you call it as regimental badge or patch that you see with axillary nerve injury. This is one of the very, 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 very important question that has been asked all the time. So let us make a quick review here. Uh, you will answer me. What is this first? Uh, x-ray which you can see over here so in this x-ray you can see that the head of the humerus is fractured right so which nerve will be damaged axillary nerve which artery will be damaged anterior posterior circumflex humeral artery here also the head is fractured over here you see surgical neck is fractured now look at the third x-ray over here what has happened over here this is a mid shaft fracture of the humerus so this would lead to which uh, nerve injury radial nerve injury and what is this fourth x-ray over here this is an x-ray of supracondylar fracture what is this supracondylar fracture which nerve median nerve which artery brachial artery again look at this again this is also supracondylar supracondylar you see the radius and ulna over here and above this you have got the humerus right so just beneath the humerus you have got a fracture and what is this fracture again mid shaft fracture of the humerus you know it now right now what is this one over here you see this part a small part of the medial epicondyle has been come out so this is a fracture of the medial epicondyle which nerve will be injured ulnar nerve will be injured and again what is this the same radial nerve that is mid shaft fracture of the humerus okay right so the next important question that was been asked is that for example if a patient is having supracondylar fracture you put a tight cast if you are not a medical practitioner or you just know how to put a cast but you don't know what are the structures that are present inside what do you do you put a tight cast when you put a tight cast what will happen all the structures inside will be compressed so as a result what is going to happen when you're putting a tight cast the brachial artery will not supply the uh, blood to the forearm muscles the median nerve is not supplying to the forearm muscles so because of this what will happen there is atrophy of the muscles that is called a shortening of the forearm muscles okay so just look at this you see there is atrophy the complete death of the forearm muscles over here that is called a shortening of the forearm muscles right so this is seen after what supracondylar humeral fracture if you are applying tight cast now this condition over here which i have discussed is called as wokeman's contracture what is this condition called as wokeman ischemic contracture right the next important thing guys so as i've already told you all these kinds of fractures over here you know when these injuries will happen these injuries are also called as foosh injuries foosh in the sense fall on outstretched hand whenever you are falling on an outstretched hand all these injuries can happen the most important uh, foosh injury which you also have to know is this particular one now in this particular one what is this this bone which you can see over here is a radial bone now, if you look here, the head, when you're falling on an outstretched hand, the head of the radius is fractured. Now, when the head of the radius is fractured, the fracture fragment is displaced upwards. 
when it is displaced upwards what will happen there will be swelling on the top so this is how it looks you see the fracture fragment over here is displaced upwards like this so there is a swelling on the top so this swelling on the top looks like a dinner fork right so this is a normal x-ray which you can see over here right you see this is a normal radius bone which you can see over here if there is a fracture you see the small part has been displaced up as a result there is a swelling on the top like this right so this looks like a dinner fork so this dinner fork deformity is also what is called as your Coley's fracture Coley's fracture okay this is called as a Coley's fracture where you see dinner fork deformity and if you see here the distal fragment is displaced dorsally very important thing and it is ang or it is angulated dorsally right and it is extra articular which means it is not involving the joint it does not involve the joint okay it is extra articular you see this is the thing you see a swelling on the top over here you see a swelling on the top this is Coley's fracture you see a swelling on the top this is Coley's fracture and this is your dinner fork deformity dinner fork deformity now just compare and contrast between both of them guys now look at let us let us say this is x-ray 1 this is x-ray 2 in the first x-ray look at the distal fragment this is the distal fragment where is it up or down it is on the top look at the distal fragment here see this is the distal fragment the small distal where is it now it is down so can i tell the first x-ray is the opposite of the second one right so first x-ray you already called it as a dinner for deformity and this is called as your Coley's fracture. Now remember the two cricketers. Remember the two cricketers, Coley and uh, who is another cricketer? L let us say Smith. Okay. So out of these two cricketers, who is on the top? So Coley's is on the top. Coley is on the top. So that is why Coley's fracture is the displacement dorsally. Right. Now if it is displaced downward, right, then that is called as Smith fracture. There are two fractures, one is called as Coley's fracture, another one is called as Smith fracture. Then what is this picture over here? This is called garden spade. So Smith fracture is nothing but called as garden spade deformity. Whereas Coley's fracture is nothing but called as your dinner fork deformity. Okay. Next important next important thing which you need to discuss. So that is regarding the humerus, guys. So these are the maximum questions that can be asked from the humerus, radius as well as ulna. Next important thing is this particular part over here. So these are all the carpal bones which you all know I guess, right? So I hope by, my, by now, by the rapid revision part, you must have understood all these carpal bones and you are perfect with this, right? So, and this is a question that was, I just uh, kept it here, but uh, this is not related to carpal bones anyways, but this was a question which was asked. Thickest border of the scapula, I already told you that is your lateral border. That is the thickest border of scapula. If I ask you what is the most common fractured carpal bone, what will be that? That will be a scaphoid. Scaphoid is the most common carpal bone. Most dislocated carpal bone is your lunate. Lunate. Next, if I ask you largest carpal bone, that is your capitate. Capitate is your largest carpal bone. And the first carpal bone to ossify is again capitate. Next, what is the shortest metacarpal? That is the first metacarpal. First metacarpal is the shortest metacarpal. So, most common fracture is scaphoid. So, this is a very important thing. Whenever there is a scaphoid fracture, where is scaphoid present? All of you know that this is your anatomical snuff box. If you put your finger in the anatomical snuff box, directly whatever bone you can feel here, that is your scaphoid bone. So, whenever I have scaphoid fracture, if I press this anatomical snuff box, will it be soft or tender? It will be tender right so if you feel tenderness if you have tenderness in the anatomical snuff box anatomical snuff box so that is a indication that there might be a fracture so what do you have to do you have to take an x-ray the best view to look at a scaphoid fracture is oblique view oblique view okay oblique view is the best view to look at a fracture if you look at the x-rays also here look at the x-rays here you see there is a fracture here also you see this is a scaphoid bone right and you see a fracture over here right so this is one one of the very important thing and i want you to remember this thing guys there is nothing to explain over here just look at the pdf and remember this they are going to ask you 
they are going to give you a x-ray of the carpal bones and ask you what are these bones over here okay next important question that has been asked once is what is a carrying angle carrying angle in this sense for example you are standing so this is pronation this is supination so you have supinated your hand like this you have supinated your hand now you you kept it normally like this right in a supinated position in anatomical position you kept your hand like this so if i am making an angle out of this part like this what what is the angle here this angle is called carrying angle carrying angle in the sense see for example if i am making a straight line straight line here in the forearm and perpendicular to that if i am making a straight line here and if i am looking at that angle here so this particular angle which you can see is called carrying angle okay so carrying angle differs from uh, person to person basically okay so for example normally in the grace the carrying angle that is given is 70 degrees in the males it would be around uh, 10 to 15 degrees in the females it will be more than 15 degrees normally okay so this is what is called as a concept of carrying angle which you need to know so what is how do you measure a carrying angle first put the hands in a pro this is pronation this is supination in the supination position okay so when you put the hands in a supination position with a fully extension fully extension in the sense manually don't extend just put your hands extended like this let us see what is the angle that is formed here okay normally so that is called as your carrying angle so if you can look at this picture over here so both of them they are not they are not wantedly you know flexing their elbows like this right so what are they the the, the man here is in a normal position the women also is in a normal position but if you look at the angle it is 10 to 15 but in the women it will be more than 15 okay that is normally seen in the women you are getting it let us look at the muscles now the muscles of the pectoral region back scapula arm forearm as well as hands now we shall discuss only those things which are really very important coming to the pectoral region remember this thing 2p 2s pectoral is major minor subclavius and serratus anterior now what are the important things you need to discuss over here is that I, I again I am telling you pectoral is major I have already discussed two majors pectoral is major teres major right where is pectoral is major attached we don't care about that what we care is we only know one mnemonic that is met me stands for medial lip to the medial lip teres major is attached so obviously pectoralis will be attached to the lateral lip so pectoralis is attached to the lateral lip you see here this is the lateral lip where the pectoralis is attached this is your pectoralis major and this is a famous muscle so fam f stands for flexion adduction and medial rotation of your arm very important action to remember subclavius see this is your subclavius not important to remember pectoralis minor if i remove pectoralis major inside i will see pectoralis minor not important to remember but what is important to remember over here is that there is a condition where either of one side the pectoralis major will be absent aplasia or hypoplasia absolutely no pectoralis major or uh, underdeveloped pectoralis major muscle along with that there will be brachysyndactyl brachy is small syndactyl is fusion of your fingers so these two conditions together you called as poland syndrome here you can see that on the right side there is absence pectoralis major muscle along with this this patient is also having the fused fingers and which are short so brachy is short fusion is syn dactyly okay clear all of you the next important muscle is your serratus anterior muscle now remember one thing serratus anterior is this muscles which are seen on the side of the chest right remember one thing that this is a powerful protractor of scapula protraction in the sense for example when i am punching someone right the more powerfully i am punching is because of the action of the serratus anterior even if i am trying to open the door right what is happening my scapula is moving forward like this when i'm trying to open the door you see my scapula it is moving forward bending forward this is called protraction of scapula and that is done by this serratus anterior muscle remember one and even for boxing also the muscle that is needed is serratus anterior that is why we called it as boxes muscle okay abduction abduction in the sense you are raising your arm for more than 100 degrees like this so this action is done by your again serratus anterior muscle clear all of you serratus anterior muscle next important thing if you look here the most most important thing that is all the time almost asked is this particular question very very high yield so 
if you look at the serratus anterior, on the surface of serratus anterior, you see a long nerve that is running down. That is called as long thoracic nerve. The root value is C5, C6, C7. This long thoracic nerve, if it is damaged, then there will be winging of scapula. So, all of you look here. Where is this? This is your winging of scapula. Okay. Where is the winging of scapula? See, when will be the winging seen? First of all, you have to do the action of that muscle. What is the action of the muscle? Protraction. So, you put your hands forward as if you are pushing a door. Right? So, here, he has put his hand forward and you don't see any scapula because the scapula is protracted forward. You cannot see a scapula. Listen carefully again. He has kept his hand forward. There is protraction of scapula. That is why you cannot see the scapula. But on the right side, even after putting his hand forward, there is no protraction. So, you can see the visible scapula. This is called as winging of scapula. Okay, winging of scapula. Right. So, this is your pectoralis major. Image based question can be asked. This is your pectoralis major. If I remove this pectoralis major, see, I have removed the pectoralis major. Inside, what will I find? I will find pectoralis minor. And next important thing that will be asked, that can be asked, is you see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all these muscles, these are serratus anteriors. On the surface here, you can see a long thread that is running down. I'm rubbing it out. Just look here. You see a long line that is running down. This is called as long thoracic nerve. What is this? Long thoracic nerve. Okay. So, if I ask you how many types of winging of scapula do you basically have? There are two different types of winging of scapula. What are these two different types of winging of scapula? If the winging is towards, if the winging is medial, medial winging if the winging is lateral lateral winging so medial winging of scapula is seen whenever there is paralysis of what serratus anterior muscle serratus anterior muscle whereas lateral winging of scapula is seen when there is a paralysis of what trapezius muscle okay serratus anterior is innervated by which nerve over here that is your long thoracic nerve long thoracic nerve trapezius is innervated by that is your spinal accessory nerve, spinal accessory nerve, okay. So, this nerve injuries will lead to the respective what, a respective winging of scapula, right. So, even in the books it is given this, that not only the spinal accessory nerve, even the dorsal scapular nerve, dorsal scapular nerve also causes the winging of scapula, okay, spinal accessory nerve and dorsal scapular nerve. Both of them causes what? Which winging? Lateral winging of scapula. So, if you look at the nerve innervation over here, that is LMNO. What is this LMNO? L stands for lateral and medial pectoral nerve. M stands for only medial pectoral nerve. Medial pectoral nerve. And S subclavius. Subclavius is nothing but nerve to subclavius. Nerve to subclavius, serratus anterior, you know that is long thoracic nerve, long thoracic nerve. So, these are the nerve innervations guys. Again, once again, remember this, this is very, very important. So, coming to this winging of scapula, as you already know, as I've already told you, that if you look at this picture over here, because of protraction, right, the hand is kept forward and uh, you can very clearly see that uh, there is no scapula because scapula has been protracted forward. So, this is a normal one. And this is the place, this is the place where there is winging, okay. If the winging is medially, that is called medial winging of scapula. If the winging is laterally, that is called as lateral winging of scapula, okay. Now, important thing you need to know, medial winging of scapula is because of what? Because of paralysis of a muscle called serratus anterior muscle, okay. But lateral winging of scapula is because of trapezius muscle and also rhomboid muscles. Even rhomboid muscles also cause lateral winging of scapula. So, what is the nerve that is innervating the serratus anterior? That is your long thoracic nerve. That is your long thoracic nerve. Long thoracic nerve. So, I already told you. Now, coming to this trapezius and rhomboid is, you have to know this important thing that trapezius is innervated by spinal accessory, spinal accessory nerve, whereas rhomboid muscles is innervated by dorsal scapular nerve. Dorsal scapular nerve. So, even dorsal scapular nerve which is innervating your rhomboid muscles can cause lateral winging of scapula. So, clear out of these the most important most common is a medial winging. This is the most common one. So, if you look at all the nerve innervations over here, 
पेक्टोरल इज मेजर इज लेटरल हेज वेल एज मीडियल पेक्टोरल नर्व लेटरल एंड मीडियल पेक्टोरल नर्व एंड पेक्टोरल इज माइनर इज मीडियल पेक्टोरल नर्व मीडियल पेक्टोरल नर्व सबक्लेवियस इज नर्व टू सबक्लेवियस नर्व टू सबक्लेवियस नर्व टू सबक्लेवियस सेरेटस एंटीरियर इज लॉन्ग थोरासिक नर्व लॉन्ग थोरासिक नर्व दैट इज योर सेरेटस एंटीरियर ओके द नेक्स्ट इंपॉर्टेंट कॉन्सेप्ट वी शेल बी डिस्कसिंग एंड आज रिपीटेडली दैट इज योर क्लावी पेक्टोरल फीशर सो द इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग्स विच आर आज ओवर हियर आर वॉट आर द स्ट्रक्चर्स दैट आर पियरसिंग दिस क्लावी पेक्टोरल फीशर सो यू हैव टू नो that uh, there are three important things i have already mentioned one two three so one two and three what is this one over here one is nothing but a vein called as axillary vein axillary vein next we have got is the axillary artery axillary artery third important thing we have got is the lateral cord of brachial plexus lateral cord of brachial plexus and fourth important thing is your lymphatics fourth important thing is your lymphatics okay now coming to the axillary vein you see a branch of axillary vein is entering inside you know what is that branch that is called as cephalic cephalic vein and even the artery also you see a branch of artery is piercing this clavi pectoral fissure that is called as thoraco acromion artery thoraco acromion artery okay lateral cord of brachial plexus from the lateral cord of brachial plexus also you see a nerve that is going inside this nerve is called as lateral pectoral nerve lateral pectoral nerve and lastly we have got lymphatics what is clavi pectoral fascia the fascia that is present between clavicle and pectoralis minor you see this particular fascia which you can see over here is called clavi pectoral fascia next important thing over here is your axilla or the cervico axillary canal so very very important thing you need to know anteriorly what do you have clavicle clavicle is present anteriorly posterior on the back what do you have scapula medially what do you have the first rib medially you have got the first rib. okay so once again over here anteriorly you have got clavicle posteriorly you have got scapula and first rib that is located medially here so this is a picture over here now within this you see a triangular shaped canal like this this triangular shaped canal is nothing but called as cervico axillary canal let us see let us see what are the borders of this cervico axillary canal okay so borders we have just now discussed right clavicle first rib and scapula now what i am telling you is that this picture whatever you can see if you are putting a camera on the top here this is the cervico axillary canal right so what i am telling you see from here all the way down you see it is increasing right so this is your uh, axilla we have discussed this part now now what we are doing is we are going little bit down when we go little bit down you tell me now medially what do i have i have got ribs laterally i have got what humerus back side i have got scapula and in the front i have got what pectoralis muscles so all of you look at this in the front i have got pectoralis muscles back side i have got scapula medially medially i have got the ribs and laterally i have got humerus right so this is the thing which i have shown now let us write down anterior wall anterior wall in the sense the front the front what do i have what is this muscle over here this muscle is your pectoralis major so how do you divide this is that if i divide this like this completely so this part is your anterior and this part will be your posterior okay posterior now if you look here anterior wall what is anterior wall consisting you tell me what is anterior wall consisting pectoralis major and minor so anterior wall is having both a uh, pectoralis major as well as pectoralis minor major and minor okay coming to the posterior wall which is on the back what is it consisting of the first important thing is uh, this muscle over here this is your latissimus dorsi and next muscle what is this a over here this a is nothing but called as your teres major how are you telling this because this is a humerus humerus is having both a and b a is called as medial lip b is called as a lateral lip to the medial lip what is attached teres major we have already discussed the mnemonic met right and in the center a lady what is that lady latissimus dorsi so teres major and latissimus dorsi are located here 
in the posterior wall okay teres major okay we have got next one is what is that we have got latissimus dorsi right and not only that posteriorly what do we have we have got scapula like this just beneath the scapula you have got subscapularis okay you have got uh, scapula just beneath the scapula you have got subscapularis subscapularis so these are the four structures that are located coming to the lateral wall lateral wall in the sense the place where the humerus is present okay that is your lateral wall so there are no structures that i have drawn here but i will write it down the lateral wall is having humerus which i just shown you and attached to humerus there is a muscle called as coracobrachialis remember this coracobrachialis okay this is the second important thing coming to the medial wall what do you have you have got serratus anterior serratus anterior that is present to the medial wall next first to fourth rib first to fourth rib okay you see the picture here you have got a rib you have got a muscle rib in the sense 1 2 3 4 the first four ribs and on the surface of this first four ribs what do you have serratus anterior muscle now what are the contents here you have got an artery that artery is called as axillary artery you have got a vein that vein is called as axillary vein axillary vein third important thing is you have got lymph nodes called as axillary lymph nodes axillary lymph nodes fourth important thing you have got brachial plexus plexus called as brachial plexus fifth important thing you have got axillary fat okay axillary fat and connective tissue these are the structures that are located down there okay let us discuss another important topic that is the breast over now coming to the breast very important thing you need to know breast ranges all the way from extends from second rib till the sixth rib so there are four important uh, mcqs that are all the time asked what is that first mcq is that as i've already just now discussed that is the breast extends from the breast extends all the way from the second rib to the sixth rib okay second important thing is that where is this nipple present nipple is present in the fourth intercostal space where is the nipple present nipple is present in the fourth intercostal space next nipple is innervated by which nerve so the nipple is innervated nipple is innervated by fourth intercostal nerve okay then the entire breast is innervated by which nerve so the entire breast entire breast is innervated by fourth to sixth intercostal nerve okay so these are the four important mcqs which you need to know next important thing is that if you divide the breast into four quadrants this is called upper medial quadrant lower medial quadrant upper lateral quadrant lower lateral quadrant okay so where is the tail present you see this is the tail where is this tail present tail is present in the upper lateral quadrant what is the name of the tail the tail is called as axillary tail of spence this tail pierces a foramen what is it foramen called as foramen of langer okay foramen of langer so if you look at this artery so this artery over here is called as a subclavian artery subclavian artery will continue as axillary artery this is your axillary artery so subclavian artery has got how many branches the one branch what is this first branch over here this branch is entering inside the thoracic cavity so internal thoracic artery okay or you can call it as internal mammary artery what is the second important thing two two here stands for superior thoracic artery superior thoracic artery what is number three over here acromiothoracic artery acromiothoracic artery acromiothoracic artery what is the fourth important thing here lateral thoracic artery lateral thoracic artery and fifth important thing is this one this fifth important thing these are called as posterior intercostal arteries posterior intercostal artery these are the blood supply of the breast so if there is, there is a question that is directly asked like this how many lactiferous ducts open into the nipple very simple guys so this is your lactiferous duct opening into lactiferous sinus which in turn opens into a lobe right so how many lobules are present overall how many 
uh, structures are present 15 to 20. Lactiferous sinuses 15 to 20. Lactiferous ducts again 15 to 20. You see what is this? This is an orange. Again you see what is this condition? This is also looking like an orange. That is why you call it as a PUD orange syndrome. What is PUD orange? PUD orange is nothing but the blockage of subdermal lymphatics. That would lead to this PUD orange. Okay. Next important thing let us discuss is that is the muscles of the back. Coming to the muscles of the back, you must know the names of these muscles, right? Second important thing is regarding the action. So, trapezius, this is the first muscle over here. Trapezius has got three fibers, superior fibers, middle fibers, inferior fibers. Look at the arrows which I have pointed there. Point number one, superior fibers will cause elevation of scapula. You see, this is the superior fibers causing elevation. Middle fibers will cause a retraction of scapula. Whereas the inferior fibers will pull the scapula down. That is a depression of scapula. Next, this muscle which you can see is called as a latissimus dorsi muscle. Okay. So, there is a question that has been asked. You see, trapezius is attached entirely to the scapula. For example, if trapezius is paralyzed, what will happen? The shoulder will droop down. Okay. So, right shoulder drooping. Whatever it is, shoulder drooping is done by paralysis of the trapezius. Not especially right. I mean, most commonly the right. Okay. So, that is why I have written it. So, right shoulder, shoulder dropping is normally seen in trapezius muscle, okay. Next important thing, coming to the latissimus dorsi, what is the function of latissimus dorsi? Remember this functions, adduction of the arm, internal rotation of the arm and accessory muscle of respiration, right. So, this is latissimus dorsi, if I am pulling this, my arm is coming towards my body or away, towards my body, towards my body is nothing but called as adduction. There is internal rotation of the arm and you should know that this is an accessory muscle of respiration. So based upon that, these are the two questions that were previously repeated in MCI. Okay. So these are the three important uh, muscles on the back again. One is called levator scapulae, uh, another one is rhomboid minor, another one is uh, rhomboid major. Same, look at the direction of the muscle. Levator scapulae is on the top, so it is responsible for elevation. Whereas rhomboid major and minor are located exactly opposite. So they are responsible for retraction of scapula. Okay, keep that thing in mind. So these are the important things which you need to know regarding the scapula. Now coming to the nerve innervation that is very very important. Uh, remember the mnemonic TAN. What is TAN? T stands for trapezius. A and N stands for what? A and N stands for accessory nerve. Accessory nerve. Okay, accessory nerve. What is latissimus dorsi? Where is this latissimus dorsi present in the thoracic region? Yes or no? So thoraco. It is present on the front or on the back? On the back. Dorsal. Thoraco dorsal nerve. Coming to rhomboid major and minor. Where are they present? They are present on the back or on the front? On the back. So dorsal. Backside where? They are present on the scapula. So dorsal scapular nerve. Dorsal scapular nerve. Sir, it means even levator scapula is also present dorsally, yes. So, you can call it as dorsal. On the scapula, yes, scapular nerve. Scapular nerve. Clear? So, this is one of the important things. Coming to the muscle, and this was a question that was asked previously. So, after every topic, whatever questions I am putting here, I am not discussing these questions because these, once you understood the topic, these questions will be easy. I want you to solve these questions. And these were the questions which I am putting here are those questions which are repeated previously. So, coming to the muscles of scapula, just remember D sits. These are not rotator cuff. Rotator cuff are present within this, but I am talking about the muscles of scapula. From this, there are four important muscles are rotator cuff muscles. So, D stands for deltoid, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres, major minor and subscapularis. Now, coming to the rotator cuff muscles, how many rotator cuff muscles we have got? Four. What are these four? S stands for supraspinatus. Supraspinatus, I stands for infraspinatus, T stands for teres minor, very 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 important thing, they have twisted the questions on this, instead of teres minor they will put teres major, no. Next important muscle is subscapularis, subscapularis, subscapularis. Out of these, above the spine you see supraspinatus, this is infraspinatus, this is teres minor. So, all these three are attaching where? They are attaching to the common point here. What is this common point? Greater tubercle. So, supraspinatus, infraspinatus and teres minor are attached to the greater tubercle. Greater tubercle. Whereas, whereas 
subscapular is where it is attached it is attached to a lesser tubercle very very important thing so rotator cuff muscle is also called as musculocutaneous cuff out of all this which is on the topmost topmost is supraspinatus that is why supraspinatus is the most commonly injured rotator cuff so most commonly injured is supraspinatus most commonly injured what is the action of supraspinatus from here from this action right from adduction if i am slowly abducting my arm to 0 to 15 degrees this action is done by supraspinatus so what is the action of supraspinatus over here initiation 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 of what initiation of abduction initiation of abduction to what 0 to 15 degrees okay so there are three degrees of abduction guys supraspinatus just now i told you what is that i told you 0 to 15 degrees is supraspinatus deltoid is 15 degrees to 100 degrees serratus anterior is more than 100 degrees abduction of arm okay why do we need these rotator cuff muscles these rotator cuff muscles they provide stability to glenohumeral joint i told you this is your glenoid cavity this is your glenoid cavity this is your humerus humerus right so there is a joint that is located between the glenoid cavity and the humerus this is called glenohumeral joint to provide stability to that what you need to do additionally you will attach some things on the greater tubercle attach some things on the lesser tubercle so overall it is providing a stability very very important thing coming to the muscles of the arm there are two types flexors as well as extensors remember one thing all the flexors are all the muscles which are located in the anterior compartment are flexors all the muscles which are located on the posterior compartment are extensors flexors remember the mnemonic bbc biceps brachii brachialis and coracobrachialis the nerve that is innervating is muscular cutaneous nerve c5 to c7 coming to the extensors two types triceps brachii and anconius radial nerve that is c6 to c8 remember one thing the entire posterior compartment from the arm forearm hand everywhere supplied by only one nerve that is radial nerve very important thing that will be asked is about the origin and insertion of biceps brachii as well as triceps brachii look here now coming to the biceps why are you calling it as biceps because there are two heads one is called long head and the one is called a short head where is long head attached look at the picture here long head is attached to the supraglenoid tubercle supraglenoid tubercle where is short head attached coracoid process of scapula coracoid process of scapula coming to the uh, triceps brachii where is a long head there are three heads long head lateral head and middle head where is long head attached here long head is supraglenoid so here long head will be infraglenoid infraglenoid next lateral head and middle head lateral head is above above radial groove and this will be below radial groove. below radial groove just look at the picture you see above radial groove whatever is starting is a lateral and below radial groove whatever is starting is the medial so look at this muscle over here you see this muscle looks similar to this right what is this this is a biceps brachii muscle which has come here you see if the tendon is ruptured here if the tendon of the biceps brachii is cut off what will happen the biceps brachii is pulled down so that is why this particular uh, type of biceps brachii where there is rupture of proximal tendon this would lead to a condition called as popoi muscle this is called as popoi muscle or popoi deformity what is this deformity this deformity is called as popoi deformity so now we shall be discussing regarding the muscles of the forearm right so muscles of the forearm are divided into two compartments one is called as a flexor compartment or the anterior compartment extensor or the posterior compartment now in the flexor compartment again we have got two superficial as well as deep so these are all the eight different muscles which you can come across here right now out of all these eight different muscles very important uh, muscle which you need to remember over here is flexor digitorum superficialis as well as another important muscle that is flexor digitorum profundus okay so what is this flexor digitorum uh, profundus as well as superficialis just have a look over here so this this muscle is called as flexor digitorum superficialis and this is flexor digitorum profundus okay so where is this flexor digitorum superficialis attached now all of you look here 
that if you can see here that we have got three important types of phalanges right so this one is called as a distal phalange this is called as a middle phalange and this is called as a proximal phalange for example if the muscle is attached to the middle phalange this muscle is called as flexor distorum superficialis for example if the muscle is attached to the distal phalanx this is called as flexor distorum profundus see here uh, the muscle here over here it is attached to the middle phalanx it is attached to the middle phalanx so this will be called as flexor distorum superficialis here it is attached to the distal phalanx so you called as flexor distorum profundus okay second important thing you need to know is that for example if this is a joint okay let us say that this is a distal phalanx and after the distal phalanx we have got our uh, middle phalanx like this okay and then let us say we have got our uh, proximal phalanx like this so let us say that this particular one is your finger if this is your finger with the nail okay now here you have got two important types of joints what are these two important types of joints so between the distal phalanx and the middle phalanx this particular joint you have got is called as distal interphalangeal joint okay in the same way the joint that is located between the middle phalanx and the proximal phalanx this is called as proximal interphalangeal joint okay so one is called distal interphalangeal proximal interphalangeal now what is the important thing you need to understand over here this is distal interphalangeal one is proximal interphalangeal important thing you need to understand over here is that for example if if the tendon is attached to the middle phalanx like this right so what is this muscle you have to call it as flexor distorum superficialis what this muscle can do is that behind this muscle whatever joint is there it can cause flexion of that particular joint okay behind this joint right i mean behind this muscle which joint is there here is there dip or pip behind this we have got pip proximal interphalangeal joint okay so this is distal interphalangeal joint this is distal interphalangeal joint this is proximal interphalangeal joint so there is flexion of proximal interphalangeal joint like this so this action is basically done by pip okay it is done by flexor distorum superficialis by flexing pip for example if the tendon is going and attaching all the way to the distal phalanx what it will do it will cause the flexion of the joint behind it so behind this tendon what joint is there there is pip or dip there is dip so what it will happen it will cause the flexion of this distal interphalangeal joint like this okay so this is flexion of pip and this particular one is a flexion of dip distal interphalangeal joint clear so pip as well as dip these are the two important things which you need to know right so this is a thing flexion of pip and flexion of dip so these are the two important uh, things which you have to definitely remember it at any cost okay right apart from this the next important thing is that now if you look here all the muscles of flexor compartment how many muscles are there eight muscles superficial deep together there are eight muscles all these muscles of flexor compartment are innervated by median nerve except okay innervated by median nerve except one and a half muscle what is it one and a half muscle flexor carpi ulnaris and medial half of flexor distorum profundus not superficialis it is flexor distorum profundus so if you can look at this this is flexor distorum profundus this flexor distorum profundus for example if i am dividing like this if i am dividing this muscle into two halves okay so what will happen this is called as your this is called as your medial half and this is called as your lateral half so what did i tell you what did i tell you here medial half of see medial half of flexor distorum profundus medial half in the sense see this particular half is medial half this medial half of flexor distorum profundus is supplied by ulnar nerve again the lateral half is supplied by what that is supplied by the median nerve so single muscle is receiving two important nerves one is ulnar nerve and on the other half there is median nerve two important nerves that is why you call this as a hybrid muscle any muscle receiving two uh, nerve innervations normally one muscle should receive one nerve if any any single muscle is receiving two different nerves that is called as a hybrid muscle 
So flexor distorsion profundus is called as a hybrid muscle. Hybrid muscle. Next is flexor carpi ulnaris. So all of you look at the picture over here. See this is your flexor carpi ulnaris. This is also supplied by ulnar nerve. Now leaving these two, remaining all are supplied by median nerve. So that is what I told you here that all muscles of anterior compartment are innervated by median nerve except one and a half muscle that one muscle is flexor carpi ulnaris and the other half is medial half of flexor distorum profundus. What are the muscles of the extensor compartment? These are the seven muscles of the extensor compartment which you need to know but very very important thing is all the muscles of extensor compartment are innervated by radial nerve no exceptions okay even it might let it be the arm the forearm, the hand, okay, arm, forearm, the hand. In all these three places, the extensor compartment is completely innervated by only single nerve that is called as your radial nerve. Keep that thing in mind. Which nerve is that? That is your radial nerve, okay. Now, another important and very important all the time asked is about cubital fossa. So, what is the concept of cubital fossa? So, if you look here, Cubital fossa has got three important borders. What are those three important borders? See, one side we have got lateral epicondyle, medial epicondyle, and I'm drawing a dotted line that is, okay, I'm drawing this transverse line touching lateral to the medial. This is called as a base. What is this called as? Base of the cubital fossa. Next, on the lateral side, we have got a muscle called as brachioradialis. On the medial side, we have got a muscle called as pronator teres, right? So, if I ask you what are the borders, there are three borders, base, lateral border and medial border. Base is an imaginary line that is touching lateral epicondyle, that is drawn across lateral epicondyle to medial epicondyle. Uh, laterally, we have got brachioradialis, medially we have got pronated teres. okay. Now, these are the borders. If I ask what are the contents, what will you tell? From lateral epicondyle to medial epicondyle, remember this mnemonic R10. What does R stand for here? R stands for a radial nerve. Okay, so what does R stand for? R stands for radial nerve. Second important thing, what does T stand for? T stands for tendon of biceps. Tendon of biceps brachii. Okay, next third important thing, what does A stand for? A stands for brachial artery. A stands for brachial artery. And fourth important thing, what does N stand for? N stands for median nerve n stand for median nerve okay so radial nerve tendon of biceps brachii brachial artery as well as median nerve these are the structures that are located from lateral to medial see for example if i am putting my arm like this this is the medial epicondyle this is the lateral epicondyle from the lateral epicondyle to medial epicondyle these are the structures i have got if you want in the cubital fossa if you palpate right so flex your hand and then palpate you can feel a tendon there that is actually the tendon of biceps brachii okay Right. So let us look at this. Let me number this and you will tell me the answer over here. So let us say this is 1. What is 1 over here? This is brachioradialis. Okay. Let us say this is what is this? 2. 2 is nothing but called as pronator teres. Pronator teres. Okay. Next, R tan, I told you. What is this? R? Where is this R tan here? See, this is R. R stands for radial nerve. T stands for this is a tendon of biceps brachii. A stands for brachial artery, which is bifurcating into radial and ulnar. See, it is bifurcating into radial and this is bifurcating into ulnar artery. Okay. Next here again N, N stands for median nerve. Again, the same things here in the real cadaveric image. So I want you to answer this. Okay, where is the medial? Where is the lateral? Very simple thing. Medial epicondyle is more protruded. If you are if you are putting your hands in the anatomical position, see this part is more protruding, right? So medial epicondyle is always more protruding. It means this is your medial epicondyle, this is your lateral epicondyle. So from lateral to medial, if you look, lateral to medial, if you look, what are the structures over here? You have to see. Out of this one, I will tell you. See here, this is a this is one of the structure which is cut off here. What is this? This is called as a tendon of biceps. So be, be, below, before this tendon, this particular nerve which you have got is called as the radial nerve. Okay. After this tendon, now you figure out where is the artery, where is the median nerve. Okay. Right. So next important thing is, 
Next important clinical part which is all the time asked is this one. Now in this, there is only one thing you need to identify. Now can you see a triangular shaped structure over here? A fascia triangular shaped aponeurosis see here. This triangular shaped aponeurosis which you can see over here, right? So this one over here is called as palmar fascia or palmar aponeurosis. Palmar aponeurosis. So what basically happens is that in some cases because of smoking or because of family history, what will happen is that within this palmar aponeurosis, there is fibroblast cells proliferation and also type 3 collagen deposition. What can happen? There is fibroblast proliferation plus type 3 collagen deposition. Type 3 collagen deposition. Now, whenever there is fibroblast proliferation, type 3 collagen deposition, what is the important thing that is going to happen? So, obviously, collagen and fibroblast, if they get deposited over here, what will happen? This part of the tissue gets contracted, right? It becomes very thick. The tissue is, from all the sides, the tissue gets pulled inside. Right? So, if you look at the picture, you will understand. You see this? Now, what, what is the thing that you can observe over here? You can see that there is a lot of tension that is developed here. Actually, why there is a lot of tension? Because there is a lot of fibroblast cells over here as well as collagen type 3 which have accumulated over here, right? Which have deposited over here causing a retraction of the tissue. Okay? So, this condition is called as Dupuytren's contraction. So, because of this thing, what is going to happen in the patient? There is thickening of palmar fascia, right? There is thickening of palmar fascia. Now, whenever there is thickening of palmar fascia, this condition you call it as Dupuytren's contracture. You call this condition as Dupuytren's contracture. Now, if you look at this Dupuytren's contracture, most commonly it involves which fingers? Most commonly it involves the fourth and fifth fingers. Most commonly it involves the fourth and fifth fingers over here. Second important thing is that muscles of the hand, these muscles of the hand I've already discussed in detail. But what is the important thing I want to tell you is that within these muscles of the hand, see this particular part which I'll be highlighting right now. Okay. This particular part which I am highlighting right now, these three muscles, right? These three muscles which I am highlighting right now and the first two muscles over here. So, these are supplied by, these are supplied by median nerve. The muscles which are marked in the yellow are supplied, the muscles which are marked in the yellow are supplied by median nerve. Median nerve, okay? Remaining. Remaining all muscles are supplied by ulnar nerve. Now, out of all this, very simple way to remember is that all the thinar muscles except adductor pollicis, all the thinar muscles except adductor pollicis is innervated by median nerve. Why? Because adductor pollicis is innervated by what? Ulnar nerve. And also remember, lumbricales, I told you, this is the first lumbricale. I, I will tell you the lumbricales now in a minute. Don't worry about that. See, normally lumbricales you have got in between the fingers, okay? See, here you have got 1, 2, 3 and 4. 4 lumbricales you have got. So, this is called first lumbricale, second lumbricale and this is called third and fourth lumbricale. So, first two lumbricales are supplied by median nerve. Next two lumbricales are supplied by ulnar nerve. Keep that thing in mind. First two is by median nerve. Second two is by ulnar nerve. See, first two is the yellow color part that is the median nerve. And remaining two, three and four is by Alnano. These are the two important things you have to remember. Okay. Now, when it comes to the lumbricales, important question that has been asked is that, so here, what is this tendon to which the lumbricales are attached, this blue color tendon? This is called flexor digitorum profundus. Okay. What is this? Flexor digitorum profundus. Now, to this flexor digitorum profundus, four muscles are attached. Out of which the first one, the first one and the second one are unipinnate. The third and fourth are bipinnate. Right? First and second are uni. Third and fourth are bipinnate. So, first and second are supplied by which nerve again? That is your median nerve. Third and fourth are supplied by ulnar nerve. Ulnar nerve. 
So this is one of the very important thing which you need to know. Now, next important question that has been asked all the time is what is the action of lumbricals? Whenever I tell lumbricals, put your fingers like this, like an inverted L. So this is your metacarpophalangeal joint. So what has happened? See now, what has happened here? This is flexion of metacarpophalangeal joint. And here there are two interphalangeal joints. I told you distal and proximal. There is extension, right? You see, once again, flexion of metacarpophalangeal joints and extension of interphalangeal joints. If I do like this, this will be called as flexion of interphalangeal joints. If I do like this, this is called extension of interphalangeal joints. So two important actions. The first important action is flexion of metacarpophalangeal joint. Second important action is extension of interphalangeal joints. Coming to palmar and dorsal interosseae also. Palmar interosseae are present here, dorsal interosseae are present here. Palmar are again four. But all these four are unipinnate. Dorsal are also four. All these four are bipinnate. All these four are bipinnate. Okay. What is the action? Palmar. P stands for palmar AD. Pad. What does AD stands for? Adduction. D stands for dorsal interosseae dab, that is abduction. Okay, so what is uh, palmar interosseae doing? See, for example, if I'm bringing or if I'm completely bringing all my fingers together like this, right? So this action is done by what? This action is done by palmar interosseae. Now, if I'm if I'm panning out all of my fingers, this action is done by dorsal interosseae. See, palmar interosseae, dorsal interosseae. This action is done by palmar interosseae. This action is done by dorsal interosseae. Keep this thing in mind. Okay. Right. What happens? What happens? For example, if median nerve is injured. So what will happen if median nerve is injured? All the things which are in the LO might be affected. Right. All the things which are in the LO might be affected. So just look here. If median nerve is injured, tell me, will abductor policies brevis work? No. If there is no abduction, my finger cannot move like this. See, this is called abduction. This is called adduction. Abduction, adduction. Abduction, adduction. If abductor is not working, I, I cannot put my finger like this. No abduction. So, my fingers will be adducted towards my uh, rest of the fingers like this. Next important thing. Flexion. Flexor policies previous. Can I bend my finger like this? No. There is no flexion. Opponents in the sense counting my fingers. Can I count my fingers? No. See, I cannot do this action. Action number one. I cannot flex action number two. I cannot oppose action number three. Three actions I cannot do. So my uh, hand will be in this way. This kind of hand you see here. This is called as ape thumb deformity. What is this? Ape thumb deformity. So this deformity is ape thumb deformity. Where do you see ape thumb deformity? In case of median nerve injury. Median nerve injury. Very, very important. In case of median nerve injury. Now, after this, the second important thing which you have to see is that, see, next important thing is, uh, if you go back here, if you go back to the muscles of the forearm, what did I tell you here? All the muscles of the anterior compartment are supplied by median nerve, right? So, this is what I told you. All of them are supplied by median nerve, right? All of them are supplied by median nerve. So, it means, it means, if you look here, Flexa digitorum superficialis is also supplied by median nerve, right? Flexa digitorum, within this flexa digitorum profundus, medial half, lateral half. I told you medial half by ulnar nerve, lateral half by median nerve, whatever it is. Let us leave sixth muscle. Now look at the fifth muscle, flexa digitorum superficialis. What is flexa digitorum superficialis doing? I have already given you a description that flexa digitorum superficialis what does it do? It will cause flexion at the PIP like this. Okay. Flexor digitorum profundus will cause flexion at the DIP like this. DIP like this. Now look here. If median nerve is not working, if median nerve is not working, tell me, can I flex my finger like this? I cannot flex. So when I tell the patient to make a fist, right? When I tell the patient to make a fist, will he be able to make the fist? No. So he can't bend the finger. So when he can't bend the finger, what will happen? The finger is extended in this way. So this uh, deformity is called as pointing index. Pointing index. Why there is pointing index? Because there is paralysis of FDP. Because there is paralysis of 
flexor digitorum superficialis. I am sorry, not FDP, it is FDS. Okay, flexor digitorum superficialis. Next important thing. Next, what is this particular test which you can see over here? Let us go back to the muscles. Now, here, what is this action? Abduction. What is abduction? Abduction is moving my thumb away from the rest of the fingers. This is called abduction. Now, this is called abduction, right? I will tell the I will put a pen here and I will tell the patient to touch the pen. See, a normal patient can touch the pen like this, right? So, see here, the normal patient can abduct his thumb and touch the surface of the pen. Now, in this patient, can he touch the pen? He cannot touch the pen. So, it means pen test is positive. Why he cannot touch the pen? Because the abductor muscle is not working. So, there is no abduction over here, right? So, look here now. So, that is what I am telling you, pen test. This test is called as pen test and pen test in this patient is positive. Okay, so there is no abduction. There is no what? There is no abduction. Not able to touch the pen. Okay, no abduction. So not able to touch the pen. Next important thing is ulnar nerve. Okay, so remember one thing. Remember one thing that for example, if ulnar nerve is damaged, then patient will have, see all of you know that uh, this part is completely supplied by median nerve. This part is completely supplied by ulnar nerve. Once again, I am telling, see here, this part where my finger is running, this part is completely supplied by median nerve. And this part where my finger is running now, see this particular part is completely supplied by ulnar nerve. If my ulnar nerve is not working, what will happen? Both of my fingers will have a claw like this. This kind of claw is called ulnar claw. Okay, you can see in the picture, this is called ulnar claw where ulnar nerve injury is happening. For example, if my medial nerve is also not working, what will happen? Even my medial three fingers also will bend like this. Okay. So, here I have got a total claw hand. So, there are two different types of claw hand. One is called ulnar claw. Another one is called total claw. Ulnar claw is only ulnar nerve injury. Total claw hand is both ulnar nerve and medial nerve. Both of them, if they are injured, then there will be a total claw hand. Okay. So, look at this picture and tell me if there is an ulnar nerve injury or a total claw. So, this injury he is ulnar nerve injury, ulnar nerve injury. This is your ulnar nerve injury. Okay, where you have got ulnar claw. Okay, next important thing. What is this picture? This is a picture of both ulnar nerve plus median nerve damage. Ulnar nerve plus median nerve damage and this kind of injury you see here, this is called as complete claw hand. This type, kind of injury is called as complete claw hand. So, for this, what are the tests we basically do? So, the first important test we basically do a, over here is this particular test which you see is called as card test. What is this card test? If you remember the muscles which I have told you already, right here, what are these muscles? Palmar introsche, dorsal introsche. Tell me, other than this LO, remaining all of them are innervated by which nerve? Ulnar nerve. So, palmar and dorsal is also innervated by ulnar nerve. Palmar introsche, what is the action I told you here? Palmar introsche is adduction like this, closing the fingers, right? Now, what I will do is that after closing the fingers, right? So, if I am doing proper adduction, all my fingers are closed in this way. So, now what I am going to do, what I am going to do is that I will put a card here. I will tell the patient, if your palmar introsche is working well, then you have to close with all of your palmar introsche. You have to close tightly so that even if I am pulling the card, that should not come out. Okay, that should not easily come out. So normally, if you are putting a card, if all your palmar introsche are working, you will close the fingers tightly. Now, if I pull, normally does the card come out? No. For example, if your palmar introsche is not working, then easily the card will come out. So this is called as positive card test. Okay. So the important question that is asked is in positive card test, which muscles are you checking actually? You are checking for palmar introsche. Palmar introsche. Second important thing is that the next important thing which you can see is here is called as Igawa test. Igawa test. What is this Igawa test? So you have checked for palmar introsche. Now you have to check for dorsal introsche. So this is a test for dorsal introsche. Dorsal introsche. What are the things you are doing over here? You will put your hand on the table, right? And then you will spread your fingers like this. Now you start moving the middle finger in this way. If the patient is able to move his middle finger, it means it means the 
it means it is normal okay if the patient is not able to move the middle fingers it means there is problem with the dorsal interosseal okay so that is your igaba test next important test this one what is this particular test oh, this is not card test rather this is called as book test actually they have kept a card paper over here but actually it is a book test so what did i tell you all the muscle, all the thenar muscles except adductor pollicis is supplied by median nerve adductor pollicis is supplied by ulnar nerve i told you right so what is this book test is that what is adduction adduction is moving my fingers towards the rest of the fingers towards my body is called adduction abduction adduction right now the same thing i am putting a card here right or a book here now i am telling you to tightly adduct the fingers what will you do i am tightly adducting it like this now even if you are pulling will the card come out no for example if my adduction action is not strong enough what will happen if it is weak right now what i will do i will pull the finger you will even try to compress it compress it compress it right you will not you will try not to let go this card still i am pulling it still you are not letting go this card and finally you see this kind of uh, appearance of the thumb here this kind of appearance which you can see over here is called as a foreman sign okay so what is a book test book test you do for adductor pollicis brevis adductor pollicis brevis adductor pollicis brevis okay so in this adductor pollicis brevis what is a sign which you can see over here foreman sign you see this uh, dip over here this particular dip is called as formant sign so patient is having what formant sign positive okay formant sign positive just for uh, a one liner question just remember it as median nerve is also called as laborers nerve why it is called laborers nerve because you know that all the muscles of the forearm are supplied by median nerve except one and a half muscle so majority of the muscles are supplied by median nerve it is with the for our muscles only we do a lot of work so that is why it is called as laborers now okay next ulnar nerve is called as musicians now musicians now okay the next important question that is all the time asked is regarding the carpal tunnel syndrome let us look what are the questions that can be asked now coming to the roof floor lateral and medial wall what is the roof roof is covered by this particular ligament which you can see here blue color ligament that is your transverse carpal ligament transverse carpal ligament floor what do you have see for example these are the carpal bones okay see here i have got 1 2 3 4 bones. there are four carpal bones on four corners okay four carpal bones on four corners now this roof which i am creating over here this is called as transverse carpal ligament now this tunnel which you have inside is called as a carpal tunnel so what is the floor consisting of carpal bones what is the roof consisting of this transverse carpal ligament now this roof is having how many corners 1 2 3 4 okay so there are four corners see these two are called as a lateral corners these two are called as a medial corners clear so lateral corners what do we have first of all let me write down the floor floor is consisting of what carpal bones carpal bones okay laterally what do you have laterally you have got scaphoid you have got another one that is trapezium medially what do you have you have got pc form you have got hamate okay so you have got uh, scaphoid over here and you have got trapezium trapezium here you have got uh, pc form bone over here and next you have got the hamate pc form as well as the hamate okay so these are the important things which you need to know next important thing is so this is a transverse carpal ligament the green color one and you see the nerve which is running inside is called as a median nerve median nerve supplies you i already told you median nerve supplies all the thenar muscles except adduct, adductor pollicis because adductor pollicis is supplied by your ulnar nerve next first lumbricale as well as second lumbricale okay a branch of median nerve is called as palmar cutaneous branch which runs above the transverse carpal ligament and supplies to the skin on the palmar side so here if i am able to have some sensations which means in the palmar aspect there is a nerve called palmar cutaneous branch so this is a branch of what this is a branch of median nerve okay so it is with the help of this branch 
I am able to feel the sensations. For example, if the carpal in carpal tunnel syndrome, what is happening? There is compression of median nerve. Okay, the transverse carpal ligament becomes so tight so that the median nerve which is passing, median nerve which is passing is compressed. So if the median nerve which is passing is compressed, see this is transverse carpal ligament, this is median nerve. So transverse carpal ligament becomes tight. When it becomes tight, what is happening? The median nerve is pressed against all the carpal bones in the floor, right? So that is what is called as your carpal tunnel syndrome. Now in carpal tunnel syndrome, which nerve is paired? Which nerve is paired? That is a palmar cutaneous. Why? Because it is traveling above the ligament, not below. Okay. So which nerve is not involved? That is this one. Now let us look at what are the contents of this carpal tunnel which we have. First content, just now I told you that is your median nerve. Median nerve. Second important content, all the tendons. Tendons that are attached to distal phalanx are flexor distorum profundus. Tendon that is attached to middle phalanx is flexor distorum superficialis. And tendon that is attached to the thumb is flexor pollicis longus. These are the contents. What are the contents above? Above in the sense superior. So superior, the first three letters are SUP. S stands for superior. U stands for what? Ulnar nerve. U stands for ulnar nerve. P stands for what? Palmaris longus. Palmaris longus muscle and again p stands for what p stands for palmar cutaneous branch of median nerve what is that palmar cutaneous branch of median nerve okay palmar cutaneous branch of median nerve so what will be the symptoms patient will have burning sensation and tingling sensation median nerve is compressed right what did i tell you the first three fingers is median nerve, these two are ulnar nerve. So patient will have burning or tingling sensation in the first finger, second finger, third finger and also half part of the fourth finger also. Okay. Loss of sensation, numbness and the pain is very worst in the night. Now this is a part which you is not present even in the anatomy book. Right. So this is something more clinical. What is this? This is called as flick sign. What is flick sign? When you try shaking the hand, what will happen? The compression will be reduced and the pain will be reduced. That is called as flick sign. Okay. There are two important tests you do. In the first test, you extend the wrist like this and you start tapping this region. When you start tapping this region, if there is a compression, you will have tingling sensation in the first three fingers. This is called tinel sign. Tinel sign. Next, another sign, you flex your wrist at 90 degrees. Right? When you are flexing here, if there is a compression over here, then again you will have pain in this first three fingers. This is called felon test. Felon test. So, tinel test. Another one is not sign. This is tinel test. This is tinel test. Another one is felon test. Okay? Keep this important thing in mind. This is percussion. Okay? This is percussion of wrist. And what is this felon? This is wrist is flexed at 90 degrees so this is a case where the there is a suicide case right where there is complete cut of the wrist with a blunt object but anyways this is not related to the carpal tunnel i mean this is not important for your exam just for the class purpose on for that i kept it here so right so next important concept over here is the anatomical snuff box. You have to know the borders of anatomical snuff box. So in this picture over here, you can see that this particular tendon, which you can see over here, right? So if I'm pulling this tendon, my, uh, my thumb is extended in this way. That is why you call this as extensor pollicis longus tendon. Next, you have got uh, just a side to it. Just side to it here, you have got another tendon, extensor pollicis brevis. If there is longus, there will be brevis. So extensor pollicis longus is there over here. So there will be extensor pollicis brevis. Apart from that, what is this action again? What is this action? This is called abduction, right? So abductor pollicis longus. So three important muscles. So which is forming the medial border? Extensor pollicis longus. Remaining two, that is the extensor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis longus, they form the lateral border. So if you can look at the picture uh, here also, See this point number one tendon which I have mentioned over here. This is a tendon of extensor pollicis longus. Okay. Next you have got tendon number two, tendon number three. Tendon number two over here is extensor pollicis brevis. Three is abductor pollicis longus. 
and this dotted lines which I have represented over here is the anatomical snuff box. Okay. Let us look at what are the contents that we have within this anatomical snuff box. First important content which you have over here is a branch of radial artery. Branch of radial artery. Okay. Next you have got branch of radial nerve. Branch of radial nerve. Next you have got scaphoid and trapezium. And very important thing you need to know that whenever there is a fracture of scaphoid in the anatomical snuff box when you palpate you will have a very important thing that is called tenderness. If you see tenderness within the anatomical snuff box it means there is a fracture of scaphoid. Next is we have got the proximal end of cephalic vein. Proximal end of cephalic vein. So these are the four important structures that are located within this. For example sometimes it can happen like this that this extensor pollicis is brevis tendon and abductor pollicis is longest tendon. These two tendons might be infected. If these two tendons are infected, where are these two tendons located? Just look at the wrist here. Where are these two tendons located? Here. Right? Somewhere here. So, if these two are infected, I will tell the patient to make a fist and bend his, make a fist and bend his wrist in this way. So, when he is bending his wrist in this way, he will have a very, very severe pain here. So, that condition you call it as decurvain tenosynovitis. Decurvain tenosynovitis. Tenosynovitis. Decurvain tenosynovitis. Okay. Where what are the two tendons? Abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. Okay. So, what is this particular test over here? This particular test which you can see over here is called as Finkelstein test. What is this? Finkelstein test. This is called as positive Finkelstein test. Very, 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 very important for your exam. So, we have discussed the injuries of ulnar nerve. We have discussed injuries of median nerve. Now, what is the use of radial nerve, guys? What did I tell you? The entire extensor compartment from the arm, forearm and hand, all of this is supplied by radial nerve. So, radial nerve is responsible for extension like this. If I am cutting the radial nerve, if I am cutting the radial nerve, what will happen? Will the extension happen? No, it will drop. So, this drop is called as wrist drop. What is this? This is called as wrist drop. What is this? This is called as wrist drop. Okay. Next, what is this? This is also called as Saturday night palsy. Even in Saturday night palsy also, you will have got a radial nerve injury. Okay. Even in case of crutch palsy, this is called as crutch palsy when you are using crutches. Even here also, you will have a radial nerve injury. And finally, you have got your honeymoon palsy here also. You have got a radial nerve injury. Okay, here also there is radial nerve injury. Coming to the next concept that is a brachial plexus. Brachial plexus, just remember RTDC. RTDC in the sense first roots, trunks, divisions and cords. Okay, so important thing you need to remember is the branches. Posterior, lateral as well as medial cord. Posterior cord, how do you remember? Remember it by the mnemonic ulnar. Ulnar. What does U stand for? Upper subscapular nerve. L stands for lower subscapular nerve. N stands for nerve to latissimus dorsi. A stands for axillary nerve and R stands for radial nerve. Next important thing is remember lateral by the mnemonic LML. L stands for lateral pectoral nerve. M stands for musculocutaneous nerve and L stands for lateral root of median nerve. Next M stands for M4U. M stands for medial pectoral nerve, medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, forearm and U stands for ulnar nerve. These are the branches which you basically have to know. So there are two important pathologies. For example, if C5 and C6 both of them are damaged, this will lead to a condition called as herbs palsy. Okay. If C8 and T1 are damaged, this would lead to a condition called as clumpy palsy. So which is on the top C5, C6. That is why this is called as herbs palsy is called upper trunk palsy, upper trunk injury or upper trunk lesion. Lower trunk lesion is what? Clumpy paralysis. So all of you look here. Herbs palsy also called waiter's tip deformity or policeman tip deformity. So what is happening? There is injury to the upper trunk of brachial plexus that is C5 and C6. Most common during the birth injury. So all of you look here. You know that this is a pubic bone. Pubic bone. So this pubic bone is against the shoulder. So whenever you are pulling the baby, what will happen? 
द शोल्डर गेट स्टक नियर दिस प्यूबिक बोर्ड सो वॉट विल है दर इज कंप्रेशन ऑफ द अपर सी फाइव एंड सी सिक्स सो दर इज कंप्रेशन ऑफ द अपर सी फाइव एंड सी सिक्स सो दैट वुड लीड टू वॉट दैट वुड लीड टू यर अर्ब्स पैलसी ओके दैट वुड लीड टू अर्ब्स पैलसी सो मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज ऑफ बर्थ इंजुरी इज अर्ब्स पैलसी ड्यूरिंग द डिलीवरी ओके so in herbs palsy what is the thing look at the baby here how do you think what are the things that are disturbed here first important thing is the hand how is the hand hand is away from the body or towards the body towards the body like this so this is called what this action is called adduction next important thing is the wrist is flexed or extended here look here the wrist is flexed and next the arm is internally rotated or externally rotated it is internally rotated okay you can see here first the arm is uh, towards the body this is called adduction of the arm the arm is fully extended like this extension right uh, next important thing is it is internally rotated like this and there is flexion here so three important things you would see what are the three important things flexion of the wrist adduction of the arm and internal rotation of the arm why there is flexion of the wrist because the wrist extensors आर वीक एक्सटेंसर्स वीक होने की वजह फ्लेक्सर्स आर टेकिंग अप द एक्शन दे टेल मी वाई अडक्शन ऑफ द आर्म इज हैिंग बिकॉज अबडक्टर्स आर वीक बिकॉज अबडक्टर्स आर वीक वाई आर्म इज इंटरनली रोटेटेड बिकॉज एक्सटर्नल रोटेटर्स आर वीक एक्सटर्नल रोटेटर्स आर वीक ओके so why there is flexion of wrist because the extensors are weak that is why there is flexion if abductors are weak then opposite action is adduction will happen if extensors are weak opposite action internal rotation will happen now coming to the abductors what are the abductors remember the mnemonic das d a s d stands for what deltoid a stands for what a stands for abductors s stands for what supra spinatus supra spinatus if you remember Uh, i have already discussed supra spinatus will cause uh, abduction of the arm to 0 to 15 degrees right remember that now from 15 degrees to 100 degrees what is it going to do deltoid is going to do the abduction external rotators what are the external rotators remember the mnemonic sid okay what does s stand for supra spinatus what does i stands for infra spinatus so supra spinatus as well as infra spinatus okay so there is nothing with the d just remember as sid but s and i stands for supra spinatus infra spinatus okay now which muscles are weak overall bad are bbb b stands for biceps brachii brachialis as well as brachioradialis these are the muscles which are weak so this is all about the herbs palsy which is called as uh, upper trunk lesion now coming to the lower trunk lesion that is called as klumpkis paralysis in klumpkis paralysis there is injury to the lower trunk where c8 and t1 so in this patient what do you see total claw hand it means both ulnar nerve plus median nerve is damaged that is why you can see in the picture that this patient is having a total claw hand like this okay so obviously it is because of hyperabduction of the arm you have studied it all the time so injury to the proximal white ramus of t1 now what is horner syndrome horner is most of you tell that horner syndrome is injury to t1 see c8 to t1 right in this c8 to t1 t1 segment if it is damaged that will lead to horner syndrome that is wrong actually the white ramus you have to mention it as white ramus white ramus of t1 three important things you see meiosis that is a constriction of pupil partial ptosis that is drooping of eyelid and facial anhydrosis it means one side there is no sweating right so you can look over here compare the pupil size in both of these eyelids which eyelid is having a small pupil see this one okay the right his right eyelid is having a small pupil right so you can see the pupil is constricted and you can see that there is a drooping also okay now look at this this is a classical one compare the pupils so on the right side the pupil is constricted and also you can see the drooping here okay so this is what is called as your klumpkis palsy okay hello guys uh, so now we shall be uh, mainly discussing regarding the axial line so first of all what is the axial line here axial line is the junction between the two dermatomes okay if you look at the upper limb over here in the upper limb you can see this is the ventral view this is the dorsal view right now in the ventral view 
uh, you can see this black line that is coming down all the way right from the shoulder all the way down till the wrist there is a black line that is extending this black line is where is this present it is present at the junction of two dermatomes right you see one dermatome c4 c5 c6 and here c8 t1 and t2 so it is present between two dermatomes and this black color line is called as axial line okay so the important thing is the same axial line is also located on the back you see this is one more black color line all the way extending till the elbow only right so this is another axial line so this was a question that was previously asked that is what is your what is axial line axial line is nothing but the junction between two dermatomes junction between two dermatomes is called as axial line so as i already told you axial line is on the front side it is on the back side also right anterior axial line and posterior axial line so when it comes to anterior axial line so where does anterior axial line start anterior axial line starts all the way from the second rib okay it extends till the wrist joint second rib till the wrist joint is called as anterior axial line now when it comes to the posterior axial line you can see here all the way from the second rib it starts from the second rib all the way till the wrist okay now coming to the posterior axial line it starts from the shoulder all the way till the elbow okay it starts from the shoulder all the way till the elbow so that is called as your posterior axial line now let us discuss the arteries over here the first artery we shall be discussing is the subclavian artery then we'll switch on to the axillary artery over here okay now coming to the subclavian artery you know that the subclavian artery is having three parts okay so what are the branches of three parts we shall discuss now now the first part is having three branches one is called as vertebral artery one is called as vertebral artery second one is called as thyro cervical trunk thyro cervical trunk and third one is called as internal thoracic artery internal thoracic artery okay there are three important vessels over here one is called as vertebral artery another one is called as thyro cervical trunk and the third one is called as internal thoracic artery now coming to the second part as well as the third part the branches of the second part are one is called as costo cervical artery coming to the third part it there is dorsal scapular artery coming to the third part there is dorsal scapular artery so how many different parts we have got here we have got the first part we have got the second part we have got the third part over here now how do you remember these branches remember by the mnemonic vitamin c and d vit stands for v stands for vertebral artery i stands for internal thoracic artery T stands for thyro cervical trunk. C and D. C stands for uh, costo cervical artery and D stands for dorsal scapular artery. Okay, so that is your vitamin C and D. Okay, now coming on to the axillary artery over here. This is one very important thing you need to know that from the coracoid process, what is the muscle that is coming out? That is called as pectoralis minor. In the same way, from the medial lip, what is the muscle that is coming out? That is teres major. Right. Now what I have done, what I have done is that. I have removed the remaining structures and have drawn only the first rib, the coracoid process, and the humerus. See, this is the first rib, right? So this would be your first rib and the coracoid process as well as the humerus. So this one is your coracoid process and this is the humerus. Okay. So let us see from where does the axillary artery start. So first important thing you need to know is that this particular branch over here is called as your subclavian artery. So subclavian artery extends till the outer border of first rib. Okay, subclavian artery extends till the outer border of the first rib. See here, originates from the outer border of the first. Rib. That is the place where the subclavian artery is going to end. See all of you look here. So this red color part, whatever you can see over here, right? So this is ending exactly near the outer border of the first rib. Now from the outer border of the first rib, the axillary artery will start. and it is passing behind pectoralis minor and later on it passes about teres major and at the lower border of teres major this artery will terminate okay 
So once again, this artery starts from the outer border of the first rib. It passes behind pectoralis minor. Then it passes above pectoralis major. And on the lower border of teres major, it will terminate. Now, who is dividing this artery into three parts? That is a pectoralis minor. That is the reason why, see, pectoralis minor is dividing into three parts, right? So, it is dividing into one, one is called as the, uh, let us say, the first part, right? And behind pectoralis minor, we have got the second part. And after pectoralis minor, we have got the third part, okay? So, there are three parts of this axillary artery. So, who is dividing it? Pectoralis minor. That is the reason why pectoralis minor is called as a key muscle of the axilla. Okay, it is called as a key muscle of the axilla. Now, let us look at what are the branches that are related to first part, second part and third part of axillary artery. So, very easy to remember that the first part will give only one branch, second part will give two branches and the third part will give three branches. Now the first part branches, so let us look at, uh, let us look at the mnemonic over here, 16 love songs and poems. Now what does it mean? So if you look here, as I told you, first part gives only one branch, second part is giving two branches and the third part is giving three branches. Okay. So if you look at the first part, S stands for uh, uh, six, that is superior thoracic artery. superior thoracic artery next t stands for thoracoacromion artery thoraco acromion artery next we have got the lateral thoracic artery lateral thoracic artery okay next coming to songs and poems song stands for subscapular artery A stands for anterior circumflex humeral artery. P stands for posterior circumflex humeral artery. Okay, so these are the branches of the axillary artery. Now, the next important concept we shall discuss over here is the axillary spaces. Right. So, as you can see the way the fingers are kept over here. So, let me number these things over here. Let me number these things. Let us say humerus I am giving 1. Next, the long head of triceps is 2. Teres major is 3 and teres minor is 4. Now, the same numbering I am giving on the opposite side also. Here, we have got the humerus that is given as number 1. Okay. Next, we are giving number 2 to the long head of triceps. Next, this is to the teres major and this is to the teres minor. So, if I zoom inside, here you can see three important spaces, right? You see, and um, let me put the dotted line. See, this space is called as a quadrangular space. See, this is triangular. This is a triangular space. This is also a triangular space. But one is called upper triangular. Another one is called as lower triangular space. Let us look at the borders now. <coughs> let us look at the borders now. Upper triangular space is located medially. See? This is your upper triangular space. It is located medially. That is why you call this as medial triangular space. Now, this medial triangular space is having a cranial end, caudal end, and a lateral end. So, look at this picture. This is a triangular space. Cranial end in the sense what the top one, right? So, this is called as a cranial end. Okay. So, see, this one is called as a cranial end. Caudal end in the sense the down one. This is called as a caudal end. And we, next we have got what? We have got the lateral end. So, this is called as the lateral end. So, what is the cranial end? Let me draw the lines now. Okay. See, with the pink I am drawing the cranial end now. This is the cranial end. Okay. With the blue I am drawing the caudal end like this. With the black I will be drawing the lateral end. Okay. So, cranial end is 4. What is 4? Teres minor. Teres minor. Okay. Caudal end is what? Teres major. And lateral end is what? Long head of triceps brachii. Right. So we have got uh, triceps brachii that is long head. So that is the long head of the triceps brachii. 
so these are the three important things which you can see over here now within this space within this space what what is the content you have i will discuss later on first of all let me discuss the borders okay next important thing is lower triangular space so lower triangular space is having a cranial end lateral and medial end okay let us see that see one is called as a cranial end lateral and medial see here this would be called as the medial end over here okay so this would be called as a medial end this would be called as a lateral end and this part over here is called as a cranial end okay so let me rub it out let us look at what are the structures that are located here so coming to the cranial end on the top what do you have you have got teres major muscle right you see this this particular muscle is continuing all the way so that is your teres major teres major is located on the cranial end next after that coming to the lateral end laterally you have got number 1 what is that one that is your humerus okay laterally you have got your humerus right next is the medial end medially what do you have got you have got the triceps brachii that is a long long head of your triceps brachii okay coming to the quadrangular space so the top one here which is located with the green identified with the green is called as a quadrangular space this is having four borders now what are these four borders see here one is four one is two one is uh, uh, three another one is one okay so on the top on the top here on the top you have got border number four and this is two this is two and uh, this would be three and this is one okay so what are these four important borders we shall look here right so on the top the cranial part is having what that is having teres minor okay the caudal part is having what teres major teres major next the medial part and the lateral part medial part is having what it is having triceps brachii triceps brachii now in this triceps brachii also what is the head over here that is your long head okay so you have got what you have got the long head of your triceps brachii and finally the lateral one is having what it is having your humerus so these are the four important parts yes or no these are the four important parts that are located in the quadrangular space now let us look at the contents of each and everything so how do you define the contents it is very very easy so just remember cd wrap okay you pick up a cd right you pick up a cd put it in a player and then you listen to the rap songs now what is cd stands for here c stands for circumflex artery okay and vein so c stands for circumflex scapular artery and circumflex scapular vein so these are the two important structures that are located over here now what is d here stands for d stands for deep brachial artery d s stands for deep brachial artery right d then after d we have got r r stands for what radial nerve r stands for we have got the radial nerve and next uh, d r a p a p what does a and p stands for a stands for axillary nerve axillary nerve p stands for posterior uh, circumflex humeral artery humeral artery okay not only artery even vein is also there humeral artery and vein so these are the contents of each and every okay so this is one of the very important uh, topic which you need to know uh, regarding the uh, triangular spaces over here so this completes the discussion of upper limb